Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third and final day of the National Symposium on Biological Invasions. Uh, my name is Guy Sutton. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a researcher at the Center for Biological Control in Makanda. Uh, I'll be facilitating this morning's session um, where we'll be continuing on the theme of managing biological invasions, but today we'll be switching our focus to, to biological control. So thank you so much for coming out and joining us today. I hope that you all have your coffees ready to go. Um, most of you will have been here for the conference, so you are well aware of this, but just some housekeeping before we can go into the session. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, please post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, this can be found in the bottom toolbar uh, next to the participants button. Uh, please don't post your questions in the chat. Keep the chat just for general discussion. Uh, please remember that when you ask your questions to please specify who your question is directed towards. And to all the speakers, uh, please rather answer your questions live. Um, please rather don't ask, uh, answer these questions in the Q&A and text, at least not until after uh, the Q&A session. So with the housekeeping out the way, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, uh, Professor Harriet Hins. Uh, Harriet, thank you so much for joining us and um, being so gracious to ac accept our invitation. Um, Harriet is going to be giving us a, a really, really cool talk today. Um, for those of you who don't know Harriet, uh, Professor Harriet Hines, uh, Hins, pardon me, is a global leader in the field of biological control of invasive alien plants. Uh, she is the director of CABI Switzerland, the leader of the biological weed control program for CABI Switzerland, and an affiliated professor at the University of Idaho. Uh, professor Hins works on several projects to develop biological control agents for invasive plants, uh, particularly in Canada and the USA. She has a special interest in the determinants of host specificity in arthropods that are used for weed biocontrol and the safety of weed biocontrol in general. Her recent work, which many of you will have seen, has included global reviews on non-target impacts in weed biocontrol. Her work has resulted in the release of beneficial biocontrol agents that protect natural and agricultural ecosystems as well as many publications in leading ac academic journals. As I said earlier, we are extremely privileged to have Professor Hins here today. And before we get to her talk, um, we would like to switch to a, a short memorial for the late Dr. Stefan Niesa. Um, many of you will know Dr. Niesa as a giant in the weed bar control field in South Africa. Um, before we get to Harriet's talk, uh, Leah May has uh, put together a short video in memory of Dr. Niesa. So please can we um, please can we see the video? And after the video, we'll have a short moment of silence in memory of Dr. Niesa. Thank you so much. I'm Leah May van der researcher at the Weeds Division of the Agricultural Research Council, Plant Health and Protection. With many of my esteemed colleagues in the process of or already having penned down the academic and scientific achievements of Dr. Stefan Niesa, I would like to honor him by expressing our profound feeling of loss, but also by remembering Stefan, an amazing person who has played a unique and special role in all of our lives. Over the past two months, theoretical physicists have been abuzz with the possible discovery of a new force of nature or undiscovered subanatomical particle that can change the way we understand the world around us forever. Pretty impressive, but not nearly as complex as having to surmise the life of a man that has over the past four decades changed our understanding of invasive alien plant species and the science of biological control. It is only possible to remember Stefan through his special nuances and our memories from all the days gone before that we were privileged to share with him. 
One of the many advantages of working with Stefan is that he used to bake bread. In the Drittendal Tea Room, Kiawi was spoiled with freshly baked bread and homemade marmalade. On those days, we found ourselves drooling in our labs and offices, counting down the minutes to tea time. And strange as it may seem, that is one of my fondest memories of Stefan. And in many respects, Stefan was just like freshly baked bread. Stefan was infectious. He drew people to him like a magnet. Stefan was all about the basics, true to the basic principles of science and life. His passion and enthusiasm lured many young minds and scientists, and he was protective over the science and the people involved. Following the death of Prince Philip, BBC News published a cartoon depicting Queen Elizabeth standing alone with only the memories of Prince Philip. And it reminded me of the fact that Bar Control too has lost its Philip. Stefan never stood in the spotlight, but he led from behind. And he always, always had your back. These days, the word legacy is a very overused word. And it seems that everyone and everything has to have one. But with Stefan, it's true. As he has left behind a very real legacy, which will be part of and remembered by the bar controllers for decades to come. The creation of Adam, a fresco painted by Michelangelo in the early 1500s, depict the hand of God reaching down from heaven, an image recognizable by generations all over the world something that ties in very nicely with Stefan, as he has kindly left us with the hand of Stefan, also an image easily recognized. In his career, Stefan worked with passion, integrity, and energy. We will miss a highly intelligent, vibrant individual with a rare friendliness and charm of personality. Stefan was a genuinely warm and wonderful individual and our sorrow is lessened only slightly with a comforting thought that we had the privilege to know him. Thanks so much, Leo Maid, for the video and your very, very kind words. Uh, I think it's only fitting that we, I think it's only fitting that we, um, go into a short moment of silence just to re remember uh, Stefan and just remember everything he's done for the bar control community in Sarko. Thank you everyone for observing your moments of silence. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to invite Professor Hins onto the virtual stage. Um, thank you so much again for joining us and um, everyone, we're now gonna be hearing about the facts, challenges and opportunities of classical biological control weeds. Uh, Harriet, over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, for inviting me. I feel really honored uh, talking to you today. And I will give you a fairly broad overview of effects, recent developments and challenges, opportunities of biocontrol. Let's dive right into it. Uh, since about the beginning of the 19th century up to 2020, 511 biological control agents were released against 211 target weeds in 95 countries. This is based, uh, this is the most recent um, update of the biocontrol uh, catalog, which is also available online. And based on uh, this data, we published several 
um, reviews, um, overviews that I will refer to um, in my following slides. But let's first start with uh, impact of biocontrol and an example from South, Amer South, uh, South Africa. Van Bilgen and co-editors uh, very recently published a book on biological uh, invasions in South Africa. And in there is a chapter by Martin Hill and co-authors uh, that summarize the accomplishments of weed biocontrol. Um, and uh, there is one um, uh, sentence in this chapter which I would like to read out, which I like quite a lot. One of the idiosyncrasies of biological control of invasive plant species is that society tends to forget the extent and or intensity of specific invasions that existed before biological control was implemented and fails to recall that there was ever a problem in the first place. When you look at the picture to the right, a nice before after picture of successful water lettuce control in Kruger National Park, you can well imagine that people forget even after two, three years, how bad the problem was. But coming back uh, to one of our um, uh, overviews, one of our summary papers, about a bit more than half of all Asian species released caused medium, variable, or heavy impact on the target. Um, when an agent uh, causes heavy impact, it means that other control measures uh, can be greatly reduced or no longer necessary. Um, medium, in medium impact, the frequency or need for other control methods can be reduced and variable impact, well, as the word says, the impact would vary depending on the location, on the site, it could be slight, um, heavy, medium, or, or, um, or no uh, impact at all. Um, so this gives you a very broad overview, very broad subjective categories. Recently, um, this approach has been refined uh, in a paper by Moran and co-authors uh, for South Africa, but I hope that this system will be taken over by other countries. Uh, they distinguish impact on four different weed parameters, density, biomass, area infested, and rate of spread, and consider the impact in different regions and habitats. So it's a much, it's a much more refined system. So for instance, for Acacia Cyclops, which is a weed of conservation areas, um, but also valued for its timber. It was clear from the beginning that biocontrol should concentrate to suppress, suppress flowering and, and seed output. And if you look at the yellow uh, highlighting here, uh, it shows that uh, biocontrol su substantially reduced density and rate of spread, but not biomass and area. Um, so, and, and below there is an example of uh, differential impact on another acacia species in two different habitats. Um, so this is a much more refined, um, mu much more refined impact categories, but you, we can also go one step further. Um, as you know, invasive plants can cause negative impacts in ecosystem processes, for instance, nutrient cycling, fire cycles, uh, cheatgrass, uh, for instance, in, in the Western United States, increases fire cycles uh, with all kinds of negative impacts on the ecosystem there. And it's only logical to imagine that if biocontrol is successful against such weeds, that we also uh, monitor the, um, uh, the, the benefits that biocontrol brings to ecosystem uh, services. Another example from South um, Africa on water hyacinth, an invasive alien plant of freshwater systems that substantially, uh, that leads to substantial water losses due to its high levels of evapotranspiration rates. And Arb and co authors were able to quantify the economic benefits that successful biocontrol uh, brings in water savings. Another example from Europe. Um, were the invasive uh, plant Ambrosia introduced from North America causes uh, severe allergies in close to 14 million people in Europe uh, with subsequent health costs of 7.4 billion. Uh, an accidentally introduced biocontrol agent, a defoliating uh, beetle, was shown to significantly reduce um, pollen concentrations in the air. And my colleague Urs Schaffner and co-authors were able to protect or protected 
uh, that this will lead to uh, about 2.3 million less patients per year and um, associated reductions in health cost of 1.1 billion. So these, um, so I think it's it's very important uh, in the in the future to do um, to highlight more of these um, of these uh, impacts that go way beyond a, a simple reduction in weight density. Of course, these studies don't come for free. Uh, the study on Lamposia was a was a big um, interdisciplinary EU project. So it's only possible if we team up. Uh, with other um, research institutes, biocontrol uh, practitioners themselves cannot uh, do that all by themselves. Uh, another area I would, uh, wanted to, to touch is um, um, how can we get better? How can the, the, we, we improve our success rate and, um, and get better in predicting biocontrol success? And um, one way is to prioritize uh, targets for wheat biocontrol. And I will use here the examples of uh, three papers that recently came out in biocontrol science and technology, again, from a group in, in South Africa um, that um, had um, um, used three different categories to prioritize a future wheat targets. The first one is impact of the target plant. Of course, um, it needs to be shown uh, yeah, that, the, that the target plant is really of importance, that there is no other control measures available that can really substantially con that can control it successfully. And then likelihood of achieving success is a very important uh, factor, of course. Um, and just to illustrate that, I would like to um, summarize a meta-analysis that was done by uh, uh, Quentin Painter and colleagues in New Zealand who um, found that uh, three plant traits were associated with um, a higher likelihood of success. Um, and these were whether the, the target is a major weed in its native range. Of course, if it's not a major weed, it, it, the likelihood is higher. It's reproduction, sexual, asexual, and in which ecosystem it occurs. And um, you see here on top uh, the highest um, a combination of these uh, traits that lead to a high proportion uh, in reduction in weed density. That does not mean that the other, um, other targets with other combinations of traits should not be targeted, but it really helps also to manage expectations of funders and stakeholders. The third uh, criteria they used is investment required um, to, con to, to launch a biocontrol uh, project against the target. And uh, again, to use uh, a painter a paper as an example, on the y-axis of the total cost per program and on the x-axis the number of agents released. Um, and you see that novel programs are more expensive than repeat programs. So repeat programs would be programs that where biocontrol has been successfully implemented in another country. Um, and um, so of course the effort is, um, is then reduced that's needed. Um, logically, the more agents you introduce, uh, the more expensive the program gets. And um, it's clear that we, we, also, so we also have to get better in predicting which agents will be successful to reduce costs. And compared to the 70s, where sometimes up to 20 agents were released, uh, for instance, against net reads in North America, that's not the case anymore. If we release two or three agents against one weed, we are already very happy. Okay, um, so let's switch now to, to safety, uh, which is uh, another important, if not the most important uh, criteria um, in, to, to select biocontrol agents. Again, I'm referring to um, a global review um, we, we did of 493 intentionally released biocontrol agents until 2016, 62 or 12.6% caused some non-target attack post-release. Um, this is 
relatively high number. I was more surprised myself, um, but that includes all non-targets attack. That it's also some kind of temporal nibbling on a plant, uh, partial development on a non-target, uh, spatially uh, limited. Uh, but the, the main point I would like to make here is that, as you can uh, see on the graph, non-target attack decreased over time, um, despite an increase in the number of agents released. And I'm convinced that this has to do with improved safety testing. Um, I mean, the petitions that we submit right now um, have nothing to do with the petitions we submitted uh, 30 years ago. Uh, there was an incredible um, advancement in, in host specificity testing from molecular techniques over um, yeah, testing methods, um, including chemical ecology, but obviously also influenced by stricter regulations. As some more facts, um, non we are very good in predicting uh, non-target attack, um, but this is a function of whether the plant has been included in pre-release testing, surprise, surprise. Um, we are also getting better at that with more, uh, with phylogenies, plant phylogenies becoming more readily available where you can see clearly which plants are more closely related to the target weed, which ones you should concentrate testing on. There are only five known cases worldwide where false negative predictions were made. So where non-target attack occurred, although pre-release testing predicted no attack. And that was um, uh, associated with several different factors, for instance, uh, that testing uh, was not um, uh, adequate or that the population other than the one um, targeted was released. I cannot go into details here, but overall, uh, yeah, there's only five cases in overall, we are, we are very good. Um, there's only three cases um, that document, um, documented where biocontrol agents have the potential to lead to negative effects at the population level of a non-target species. Uh, so I think our safety record is, is really good. Nevertheless, the perception of many people is uh, that um, biocontrol is risky. And I think it simply boils down to the fact that bad news sells better than good news. Um, and that the few cases where biocontrol did go wrong um, simply received more attention. So we have to publicize our successes, but at the same time manage expectations. Can biocontrol be successful? Yes, for sure. Can it restore um, degraded um, ecosystems due to invasive species in certain circumstances, but more often uh, it needs to be integrated with other control measures in order to achieve that. Regulations is another challenge, and I could talk a whole hour just about that. It's not only the hurdles to introduce agents, um, to release agents, and of course these regulations are, uh, are very important, um, but they have become quite high. Um, and at the moment in, in North America, it takes a long time to release an agent. Uh, but it's also the sourcing uh, with the Nagoya protocol access and benefit sharing uh, regulations in place. It becomes more and more important to source agents. And our group, for instance, had to move out of some countries um, because of that. Um, opportunities, more and more herbicides are banned because of um, health uh, risks. Um, Biocontrol does not have any any risk does not pose any risks to animal or plant health. Big advantage. Uh, there is also more and more resistance of uh, target weeds to herbicides, which um, um, yeah people need to look for alternative methods, including biocontrol. And there's cases where invasive weeds are already very widespread. They occur in sensitive or remote or difficult to access areas or occur on extensively managed land where weed biocontrol is simply the only um, um, uh, economic um, method that may have a chance to lead to um, sustainable uh, success of weed control. And another opportunity uh, is, um, I think, emerging in developing countries where invasive weeds are uh, negatively impact rural livelihoods. 
Um, and I believe where South Africa could play an important role and is probably already playing an important role in terms of capacity building, in terms of knowledge transfer, uh, transferring agents to other countries. And uh, just to finish here, um, uh, an example of a prosopis. It's, an, it's another of these water sucking uh, trees, uh, which is invading Africa here, an example from Ethiopia. And a vipe, um, a moth, uh, has just been introduced a few weeks ago in South Africa. And uh, I believe it could in the future benefit other countries. And with this, I end. Um, and I thank you uh, again for the invitations and looking forward any questions? Thanks very much, Harriet. Uh, I think I can speak for all of us. That was a, a really, really interesting talk, um, and I'm sure it's going to create a, a lot of discussion. Um, <clears throat> everyone, so we now have a few minutes for questions. I see there are a few in the chat already, but if you Thank you have a question please put it in the chat and we can see how many we get through um harriet i'm gonna ask you that if we don't get through all the questions if you wouldn't mind just answering them um by typing out your answers using the q a function so the first question from samantha um asks harriet how long after the first release of an agent Just moved on. How long after the first release of an agent should impact be measured? That does it or should it differ? Does it or should it differ for different hosts and different agents, e.g., seed feeders versus leaf feeders? Yeah, that's a that's a challenging question and but a very good question. Um, in fact, um, monitoring should already start before agents are released in order to get baseline data. That's super important to remember. Um, the more and longer term baseline data you have, uh, the better is then the data you, you can collect post release. Um, and then, of course, it depends on the um, mode of action of the agent. Um, as I have shown for water weeds, it can be super rapid within a few months even. Um, so you really need to also know that in advance uh, because there you might just um, uh, fail if you, if you only look after two years, while a very good example with seed feeders, it might take 10, 15, 20 years. Um, so unfortunately, there's not a clear, a very clear answer to the question. I think you really need to know your system and adapt your monitoring accordingly. Sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the next question from John Wilson asks, Harriet, how do we guard against overselling, uh, especially given the need to sell biocontrol to our funders? Um, well, we just have to be realistic. I think this uh, prioritization uh, scheme that I showed uh, could help a lot. Um, I mean, it, it, I didn't show the details. It uh, came up with a list of uh, 20 top weeds in, um, but you can also present that in a matrix form where you have uh, the likelihood of achieving success versus the severity of the target. Um, and I think that could, using that uh, could, um, could help to give the, your stakeholders, your funders, a good appreciation of how, how likely it is um, to achieve, um, to, to, well, to, first of all, to find a, a specific enough biocontrol agents and then to achieve success um, and, and weigh that against each other against the severity of the target. Yeah, okay, so what, one last question is, Herd, in, in your opinion, um, how do you think that um, these improvements in biocontrol safety and efficacy uh, are going to translate to uptake of weed biocontrol in Europe, if, if, if it's going to help at all? Okay. Uh, I think in Europe, um, 
it's a bit of a different story. Um, and it's not necessarily the advancement in our technique, but it's more, it's first of all political uh, because we're still lacking uh, Europe-wide regulations uh, to even introduce biocontrol agents. And the second is um, the perception of people which are not used to biocontrol. And I think it will be extremely crucial to choose um, the right target weed um, you know, like ambrosia with health uh, consequences, so that people really um, get a positive feel about biocontrol and don't put us in with GMOs or whatever. Um, so I think in Europe, it's uh, since it's still in it, its infancy, it's kind of other questions that. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think we are out of time for live questions. There are going to, a few more questions for you in the chat. Um, if you wouldn't mind just answering them in your spare time, that would be much appreciated. But thank you so much again uh, for taking the time to come and talk to us. We really do appreciate it. And what a fascinating talk and a, a privilege to have you on. So thank you again. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. So that's uh, Professor Hens from Cavi in Switzerland. Uh, what an absolute pleasure to have her on as our keynote speaker. And without further ado, we're going to go into our short and long form talks. Um, we'll have about six or seven talks, and then we'll have 15 minutes for discussion. So keep your, please post your questions up as you think of them. And let's get into some more biocontrol. So thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of the session. Hi everyone, my name is Megan Reed, and I'm a PhD student at the Centre for Biological Control at Rhodes University. Today I'm presenting a paper uh, that's recently been published in Aquatic Botany, where we looked at the population genetics of an invasive water lily in South Africa as part of the development of a biocontrol program. Water lilies have been uh, popular in horticulture since at least the late 1800s especially when a man named Latour Marliac began creating hybrids. And so people started planting these water lilies in their ponds. But as often happens with these attractive horticultural plants, they end up in the wrong places and they become invasive. This is the case for uh, Nymphaea Mexicana or Mexican water lily or ye yellow water lily, uh, which usually has yellow flowers, green leaves with some brown blotching and often red undersides. This plant originates in the southern United States and parts of Mexico, but it has since become invasive in numerous countries around the world, including parts of Europe, uh, also in Australia and New Zealand, and of course in South Africa. Within South Africa, we've recorded it in seven of our nine provinces, and as such, it's been categorized as a member category 1B invasive weed, which requires uh, management. Unfortunately, management is difficult. Uh, mechanical control is often ineffective because the plants just regrow from tubers that are rooted in the soil. Uh, and chemical control is often only effective in the short term. So biological control is a desirable management strategy for the species. We're finding that there are morphological variations of the plant uh, in the invaded range. And we know that hybrids do exist. But unfortunately, it's often difficult to tell between the hybrids and the parent plants because the hybrids possess intermediate character states uh, inherited from the parents. For biological control to be successful, it's important that we understand the population genetics of the plants so that we can select agents that are more likely to be, uh, to be adapted to feeding on uh, the invasive plants. So in order to understand the genetic, uh, popu or the genetic structure of the populations in South Africa, we used inter-simple sequence repeats and ran analyses in a program called Splitstree to compare uh, the similarity between the plants in the invaded range in South Africa with the plants from the native range in the Southern United States so that we could determine which plants are likely to be hybrids and which are the original Nymphaea mexicana species. 
Then using these results, uh, we compared the genotypes to the phenotypes so that we could get a better understanding of which plants uh, look like hybrids and which look like the original species. At the end of our analyses, we created this tree. Uh, so you'll see the, the part that's circled in red represents the invasive hybrids that clustered separately uh, from the other group, which is circled in blue, where we have the samples collected from the southern United States in the native range. Uh, and the part at the top that's a dotted circle that represents the samples uh, collected in South Africa that clustered with samples from the invasive, uh, sorry, from the native range. So in seeing this, we can see that uh, for the invasive hybrids, they're characterized by um, a lighter color uh, flower, often where the petal tips are more rounded. Uh, sometimes there is a pink tinge in the petals, where with the pure or original Lymphae mexicana, the flowers are a very bright yellow with pointed petal tips. Um, so we get to see the differences between the hybrid plants and the original Nymphaea mexicana species that are similar to the plants from the native range. In understanding the population structure a bit better, we can now make some more targeted decisions for developing biocontrol and in choosing agents that uh, are more likely to be successful on the plants in the invaded range that are more similar to the plants from the native range. Um, in terms of controlling the hybrids, this might be a bit more of a challenge. Um, there has been challenges in the past with other species that have hybrids, but uh, other papers might show that hybrids uh, are more susceptible to herbivory. So we'll have to conduct some more experiments to figure out what's going on there. This research wouldn't be possible without the support and funding from um, the, all of these organizations. So we are great, very grateful for the assistance. Um, thank you very much. Good morning. And what I'm hoping to do is provide a brief overview on some of the more recent developments that have occurred with regard to Prosopis biocontrol. For those of you not familiar with Prosopis, these are spiny leguminous trees or shrubs, which were first introduced into South Africa from North and South America during the late 1800s. These trees were widely promoted and planted up until about the 1960s, given their perceived benefits in arid areas in which they can provision shade, fodder, timber, and fuel wood. Now, some confusion does exist surrounding the exact species that were introduced, but suggestions do say that Prosopis glandulosa vartoriana and Prosopis valutina, as well as their hybrids, seem to account for much of the Prosopis invasion and continue to spread. Recognized as a major invader in South Africa, Prosopis is widely distributed across the west of the country, particularly within the Northern Cape and surrounding provinces, which seem to suffer the most dense and impactful invasions. Now, our last known estimates suggested that some 1.8 million hectares of South Africa was covered in Prosopis. However, these figures are close to 15 years old and somewhat outdated, with researchers suggesting that our current Prosopis invasion is likely nearer. 8 million hectares. Attempting to manage such an invasion is a daunting task with conventional mechanical and chemical controls quickly deemed unsustainable. Biological control, therefore, offers us a cost-effective and long-term solution, and efforts were undertaken during the 1980s. However, given the perceived benefits of the trees, only agents targeting seeds or seed pods were permitted for use with three seed feeding weevils having since been released, two of which have become established, namely Naltumius arizonensis and Algarobius prosopis. The latter is believed to be more widespread and damaging. And in 2001, the decision to start to evaluate agents that attack all parts of the plants were taken and largely paved the pathway forward for some of our more recent developments. And these developments have actually included more concerted efforts on Prosopis bar control, which have largely taken three broad avenues. The first is the goal of making use of our current agents to reduce seed set and seed spread. And this will be done by mass rearing Algarobius Prosopis at mass rearing centers that are currently being built in Uppington and Carnarvon. The second has been the assessment and release of additional or damaging agents that were previously identified. 
So far, two new agents have been cleared for release, namely the leaf tying Marky Vippy and an additional seed pod feeder, Pseudocephalapion gandalfoi. The first Evippy was released in February this year and holds great promise in the fact that it can be highly damaging in hot, arid areas. Whereas the seed pod feeding weevil Pseudocephalapion is promising in the fact that it feeds on green immature pods before they fall off of the tree. Unfortunately, we're still awaiting importation of individuals from Argentina, which has been delayed by COVID. In addition, two fungal species have been isolated from diseased bark of prosopis trees in South Africa. And these were found during surveys, and they're currently being assessed in terms of their pathogenicity and use as potential mycoherbicides. And the last of these three avenues has been work on identifying new candidates particularly through native range surveys. Prosopis does encompass a wide native range spanning large parts of North and South America, which offers us a potentially large suite of agents which are yet to be fully explored. To aid in these native range surveys, ongoing collaboration with Professor Dave Thompson at New Mexico State University is currently assessing a suite of potential candidates on Prosopis in parts of the US. And these include insects such as Tumelia mirabilis, a scale insect, node boring bustricids, as well as potentially root feeding weevils. Likewise, collaboration with Dr. Fernando McKay from Fuegi in Argentina has also been investigating potential candidates, namely a group of stem galling wasps in the genus Ascatoceras, with Ascatoceras muriatus being one of the more promising candidates. Overall, these renewed biocontrol efforts are highly commended and offer us promising avenues towards the management of prosopis. Mass rearing, the assessment and the release of new agents, as well as international collaborations, serve not only to enhance the potential of biocontrol, but will hopefully aid in reducing the invasive range and negative impacts experienced in South Africa from prosopis. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Sivan Atiati, and I'll be speaking about the host specificity of Chabatina minicar a potential fire control agent of invasive tamarack species in South Africa. Now let us begin. Tamarack is a multi-branch retrofit tree or shrub that originates from Eurasia, the Mediterranean, North and Southern Western Africa. Now, due to its tenacious nature, it has been successful in invading parts of North America, parts of South America, Southern Africa, and Australia. Now the United States has successfully controlled the expansion of invasive tamarix communities using chrysomelid biocontrol agents, namely Diarapta elamata and Diarapta carinulata. Diarapta carinulata has underwent host specificity trials in South Africa, but was unfortunately rejected due to the non target effects it displayed on our indigenous tamarix species, that is, tamarix cisnoides. This graph from Merlin and colleagues exemplifies those non target effects by showing that from a generation of Diarapta eggs, Close to 50% of those eggs were able to survive to adulthood on Tamarix Eusnoides. We rejected Diarapta granulata as a potential biocontrol agent. We started investigating Chabatina minicara, which is native to the Middle Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Its eggs hatch and develop into adults in approximately 10 weeks. Mature Chabatina females feed on the Tamarix phloem and produce honey jewel as a byproduct. Additionally, these females secreted and carrying wax substance through the epidermal wax glands, which develops into a proud ovisac that is responsible for protecting both the offsprings and the female itself from water loss, wet conditions, natural enemies, and contamination from the honeydew. The adult males have a lifespan of only two days in which his main goal is to find a fit female to reproduce with. Now, Chabutina Menipara is a potential fire control agent because of its native range overlapping with that of invasive tamarind species present in South Africa. Additionally, field studies in Israel revealed that Chabutina Menipara does not occur naturally on tamarind cephala, which is a sister taxon to tamarind eusmoides. The aim of this experiment was to evaluate the insect and plant interaction between Trabutina minipara and the different tamarind species present in South Africa. A specific objective was set, which was to perform host specificity trials on Trabutina minipara. Hardwood cuttings from known South African tamarind populations were cultivated for 24 months at the University of Witwatersrand. Eight tamarind plants from the following genotypes were used: Tamarix eusinoides. 
Tamax chinensis, Tamax hermosissima, and the hybrid between Tamax chinensis and Tamax hermosissima. Six experimental plants were inoculated with 15 Travertina mini power crawlers. And we began to monitor the appearance of honeydew droplets as a sign of attachment onto the chosen taxa by the inoculated crawler. The appearance of adults as a sign of successful development of the inoculated crawler and thereafter winged male selection as a proxy to host to ho selection. Lastly, bark tannin concentration amongst the selected Tamarix taxa was measured following the tannin analysis protocol by Molen Waterman. We'll come back to why that was done a bit later on. There was no significant difference in the number of Trapetina mini power crawlers settling and surviving on any of the four Tamarix taxa that were chosen in this experiment. It took 14 weeks for the inoculated crawlers to settle and develop into adults on the indigenous T. eusinoides compared to 10, 13, 12 weeks on T. chinensis, T. romosissima, and a hybrid, respectively. There was no significant difference between the mean number of dead adult males found on either Tamarix taxa observed. The mean bark tannin concentrations were also not significantly different between the four Tamarix taxa analyzed. Antics are most likely to select closely related plants as hosts. It was expected that Tamarix remississima and Tamarix chinensis would be similarly susceptible to Travertina minipara infestation because they are phylogenetically closely related. However, what was not expected was that T. eusnoides would form part of the insects' diet as well, as it is a distant relative. Ripper et al. 2019 suggests that secondary metabolites can be the primary determinants of insect host specificity over phylogenetic relatedness. No significant difference in the bark tannin concentration of the four tested Tamarix genotypes could go some way to explain the settling behavior of Travertina minipara and suggest that further investigation of secondary metabolites might benefit agent selection for this biological control program. This study demonstrated that Travertina minipara is not a suitable biocontrol agent for use against invasive Tamarix taxa in South Africa. The scale insect could mature from the nymphal crawler stage into adulthood on all four Tamarix taxa, including in the indigenous Tamarix eusmoides, with no significant difference in the whole suitability. Our next hopeful is a coniatus weevil, which we are yet to genetically identify. However, in a quick no choice test, we analyzed the amount of fast particles produced by the insect when exposed to one Tamarix species and found no significant difference. However, in a 10 hour choice trial, T. Usmodi came up as the least preferred species by the weevil. More work still needs to be done and will be done. Thank you very much. Good day, colleagues. My name is Ketan Mawera from Agricultural Research Council. I'm going to talk to you about the potential of the leaf mining moth Melanocinclis species as biological control agent of Tithonia diversifolia in South Africa. Tithonia diversifolia is one of 11 Tithonia species that are native to Mexico, of which three are invasive in South Africa. Tithonia diversifolia was introduced during the 1900s as ornamental and through agricultural trade. It is a perennial shrub that grows to five meters with deeply lobed leaves and produces bright yellow flower that looks more like the sunflower. It reproduces sexually and asexually, producing a large number of seeds that allows it to create dense monoculture stems. The distribution of Tithonia diversifolia is along the tropical and subtropical regions. In South Africa, it's invasive in Limpopo, Mpumalanga, and KwaZulu Natal province. The biological control program against Tithonia diversifolia was initiated in 2007. That led to the release of the leaf feeding tortoise beetle, Physonota maculoventris, in 2018, that is currently established at 50% of the release sites. The most promising candidate agent is the leaf mining moth, Melanocinclis species. This moth was collected for the first time on Tithonia davis folia in 2012 at four provinces in Mexico. The larva feed within the palisade layer of the leaves 
leaving the upper cuticle intact, thus severely damaging the plant, as you can see on the left. The aim of this study was to determine the safety of the morph as biological control agent of Tythonia divis folia in South Africa. This was done through no choice and multi choice tests. On, multi, on no choice tests, one plant species is confined in a cage with 10 pairs of the moth. The moths are allowed to attack the plant until they die. The plant is assessed for the feeding damage that is rated from zero to three and the number of adults that emerged. While on the multi choice tests, different plant species, including the target wheat, are confined in a cage with 50 pairs of the moth, and the moths are allowed to attack those plants. The plants, the plants that were attacked they are removed from the cage, put in separate cages to further assess the feeding damage and the number of others that we image. During no choice tests, 30 plant species were used, including 25 varieties of sunflower. The plant species were within Astraceae family, Brassicaceae, Poesi, Solanaceae. And most of the plants were in Astraceae family, particularly on Helian Thea tribe, where uh, Tythonia divis folia falls under. The results of the no choice tests, the moth attacked four plant species, including the target weed, but it showed high preference on Tythonia divis folia by looking at the adult imaged and the leaf feeding damage scores. During multi-choice tests that included the target weed and uh, all the plant species that were attacked during no choice tests, the moth attacked only the target weed Tythonia davis folia in its relative Tythonia retin folia with the highest number of adult imaging on Tethonia davis folia and the highest feeding rate on Tethonia davis folia. In conclusion, during multi choice tests, the moth only attacked Tethonia davis folia and Tethonia retin folia, which are weeds, a strong indication that the moth is highly host specific and will pose no threat to the cultivated sunflower and the other non target species if released as a biocontrol agent in South Africa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lulama Madire from Agricultural Research Council. I'm going to present the impact of mother polluter on Tecoma stands at East London. Mother polluter was released in 2016 at East London. And mother polluter is a leaf feeder from Mexico. Both the larvae and the adults, they feed on the leaves of, of Tecoma stains. So the release sizes of 200 to 400 adults were conducted at seven sites at East London. In 2018, three of the seven sites were selected for post-release evaluation. The aim of the study was to assess the impact of mother polluter on leaf density, leaf damage, and fruit production, and also to measure the beetle's initial dispersal rate. So the materials and methods that were used for the study. The study was conducted at six sites, three were the release sites, and three were controlled sites. So the controlled sites were located eight kilometers away from the release sites. And uh, 30 uh, branches from different trees were randomly selected uh, that, that were 80 centimeter long to assess the plant damage. And also the dispersal rate was measured from the release 
site to the furthest point where establishment was confirmed. The parameters that were measured was leaf density, leaf damage, fruit production, and the dispersal rate. Then the results of leaf density showed the significant reduction on leaf density on the plants that had a biocontrol agent mother polluter compared to the, control, to the controlled plants. So there was, in 2020, there was a 15% reduction, and in 2021, there was a 10% reduction on the plants that had mother polluter compared to the, bio control, to the controlled ones. And the leaf damage, there was a significant increase on leaf damage between 2020 and 2021. The leaf, the leaf uh, damage increased uh, by 38% between 2020 to 2021. On fruit production, there was a significant reduction on the fruits, on the plants that had mother polluter compared to the controlled sites. And the reduction was 98%. The dispersal rate, the average dispersal rate was 0 0.31 per year. And the conclusion, we find that there was a significant reduction on leaf density and fruit production. Most of the plants were highly defoliated, the ones where mother polluter was released. And also the very same sites there was a lot of reduction in terms of fruit production. And we also realized that it, it, both matured plants and the seedlings are attacked by mother polluter. And according to the results on the dispersal rate, we find that mother polluter is a slow disperser. And though mother polluter is a slow disperser, we feel that if the sites remain undisturbed at East London, Mother polluter uh, populations will increase and the, and, the, and the invasiveness of tacoma stands is likely to reduce. I just want to acknowledge all these people that have contributed to this study and thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present um, what I consider the highlight of my biocontrol career, looking at recent successes with water hyacinth. And just to put the research and implementation that we do into context, South Africa is a water restricted country, and as a result, government has had to invest in the building of um, dams throughout the country to increase our storage capacity. And this is just a picture of the Baal barrage um, on one of our largest rivers. And a series of these dams have been built up in the, in the Gauteng Northwest region. And if we zoom in on that, it's this series of dams that are particularly eutrophic and perhaps hypertrophic. And all of them have been invaded by water hyacinth. The focus of this talk is um, the water hyacinth invasion on Harder Beersport Dam and what's happened in the last few years. So Harder Beersport Dam was built in the 1920s to supply the ever increasing for, uh, demand for water further downstream in, in the, the Brits Valley. It's considered possibly the continent's most eutrophic dam. And as a result, it's, got, it's, it's had water hyacinth on it for a very long time. He has an aerial view of the water hyacinth infestation in about 2017 when water hyacinth was probably at its worst. So the dam's been hypertrophic since the 1970s and while water hyacinth has been chemically, chemically controlled, considered successful in the 80s, the eutrophication has never been addressed. And it's eutrophic because it receives runoff from the big metros of Johannesburg and Pretoria um, and the, the water treatment plants just cannot cope with the amount of um, water coming out of these, these metros. So in 2007, the Hartis Metia May program was initiated. And this was a bioremediation program aimed at 
remediating the dam through the removal of um, plant biomass, of water hyacinth biomass, and blue green algae. By 2015, hundreds of millions of rands were spent, didn't have very much success, and in 2017, the Department of Water and Sanitation pulled the plug on this project. And what resulted or what remained was mats of water hyacinth, blue green algae, and these just fluctuated in their, in their density and occurrence. So just to put the water hyacinth biocontrol program into context then, since 1974, we've had a suite of agents released against water hyacinth. And the first was the, the, the weevil, Neocatana corneae, released in the 1970s, followed by these additional agents. And all of these agents have been released around South Africa, and all of these agents were released on Hollywood Dam. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, biocontrol in these high-lying areas is limited by temperature. These are plants in the beginning of, of summer. And in the, by the end of winter, the plants have died, the leaves are dead, there's no food for the agents, and the cold um, temperatures increase mortality of these agents. In addition, these systems are eutrophic and biocontrol or classical biocontrol and in eutrophic conditions is just um, incredibly limited because the plants continue growing while despite the, the amount of biocontrol. So all of these red dots are systems in South Africa that have been invaded by water hyacinth and they're all above what is considered the 0.1 milligram per liter phosphorus threshold for biological control. In 2001, Hill and Olka said that eutrophication and cold winters limit the success of classical biological control and that we need to investigate how to overcome this. And one of their suggestions was new courses of action, which included the release of additional agent. And the highlight of this talk is Megamelis cutularis, or the silver bullet. It was released in 2013 at a few sites around the country, and we didn't really rate it very much until 20, until the, the, the last few years. So in 2018, we were asked to get involved with biological control on Hardapias Port Dam. This is a picture or a satellite image of the dam in the beginning of 2018, just after it was, <clears throat> the, the cover was about 47%. And what's important to note is that no herbicide applications um, had been implemented since the end of 2017. So these plants were growing in the absence of, of any form of control. We went to a site here, this is called the Islands in um, near Pekinwood Estate, and we're quite surprised to see that the plants were actually heavily damaged by the weevils. So all these little feeding scars you can see here is weevil damage, but the mat remained. And so we decided to give Megamelis a go. We decided that one of these new courses of action was releasing new agents, but also focusing on inundated mass releases. And so we set up a mass rearing uh, station at Pekinwood College, and the, the school learners from the college uh, released insects straight into the dam. And then our PhD student, Camille Wessabola, also released approximately 6,000 insects every two weeks that we sent her from our mass rearing here at Rose University. And this carried on for the duration of 2019. This is what the dam looked like on the 29th of September. This was possibly the height of the infestation. The dam was um, about 50% covered. And the satellite image would tell us that not much was going on on the dam. By the 3rd of December, however, that amount of water hyacinth had reduced quite significantly. And in early January 2020, we started a field campaign on another program and got to have a close-up look at the plant on the dam. And this is what we saw. This is at the dam wall, you can see it in the background. And all of this, these brown plants are dead water hyacinth plants. They were heavily damaged by biocontrol agents. Every single plant was infested with, um, with, the, with, the, with the control agents. And these Green plants on top are other species using the water hyacinth as a substrate, indicating that this couldn't have been a chemical um, application because all the plants would have died. When we had a close-up look at the actual plants, we could see hundreds of megamelis per plant. We've got adults, nymphs, lots of little nymphs on the stem, as well as lots of weevil feeding scars. And this was honestly the highlight 
of, of my, my years in biocontrol. By the end of January, that amount of water hyacinth had decreased to less than 10%. Through winter of last year, things were looking pretty good. But towards the end of the year, when temperatures increased, we started to notice water hyacinth was returning. So why the sudden increase? And this is from seed banks. Each water hyacinth um, is capable of producing thousands of seeds, which reportedly remain viable for up to 25 years. And when light and temperature increases in springtime, these seeds germinate. And this is, a, this is an image of seeds that we found from sediment cores taken from, from um, and here is an image of these seedlings start that have just germinated um, and starting to take over the dam. By the beginning of December, we were back to that very scary situation of um, 2018, 2019. But when we went to investigate the plants, we were pleasantly surprised because what we noticed was exactly the same thing as we had seen a year earlier. And this is a happy biocontroller. Again, hundreds of thousands of megamelis present on these plants. And you can also see the dominance of these winged megamelis, which means that they're ready for dispersal. By, the, by um, February, that matter decreased to just the western basin of the dam. And when we went on another um, trip to have a look at what was going on, we found the same thing, dead, dying plants and hundreds of thousands of biocontrol agents absconding because the plant quality was so poor that they were leaving the plants in search of more water hyacinth. And at the end of March, when we went back, this is what, this is pretty much the most water hyacinth that we saw. Here's a time series of the water hyacinth cover on the dam. The highest points um, in October 2019, and again in December 2020, this crash was the bio was was as a result of the biocontrol damage, followed by the increase in spring, and again another decrease. And this wasn't just at Harder Beer Sport. We've seen a very similar thing happening at Rudderplot Dam: an increase in water hyacinth, followed by a crash and again associated with incredible numbers of megamelis and other control agents. And here are satellite images. This is from September, I mean November 2020. And here you can see less than 2% cover in late March this year. So what we've realized is that we have to shift our focus from, from classical biological control to implemented biocontrol. And although we know water hyacinth biocontrol is limited by a number of factors. We believe that embarking on an inundative mass release program in the absence of interference from herbicide operations can result in control. Thank you very much. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Parthenium hysterophorus is an annual asteraceous weed that has invaded about 50 countries around the world. It has prolific seed production, allelopathic properties, and a long lived seed bank in the soil. In Southern Africa, it invades the northeastern parts of South Africa, as well as neighboring Eswatini, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Botswana. It is also present in many Western Indian Ocean islands. A national management strategy was devised and the country was split into zones. And the most densely in invaded zones in um, Pomalanga, Northern KZN, and Northwest were targeted for biological and chemical control. This is because the plant impacts severely on crop and animal production. And it is also present in many national parks, as well as around rural settlements where it impacts on people's health as well as their animals' health. In 2003, a biological control program was initiated. This, prior to this, the Paxinia bracta winter rust fungus was detected, not intentionally introduced into the country. It operates at cooler temperatures than when the parthenium weed is abundant in, in, in summertime. So um, in 2010, the summer rust fungus, Paxinia xanthi, was introduced. It has a higher operating temperature. With minimal release effort by transplanting infected plants into 10 sites or so, 
it achieved good impact with widespread dispersal and high incidence at some sites. It, it, its studies are currently underway to determine its impact and the recommendations are that it should be released where it is not yet present. The stem boring weevil Lystronotus satosi pinus was introduced in 2013. About 45,000 weevils have been released at more than 150 sites. It is very um, tolerant of dry conditions and it is damaging. Um, and in the field, we see wilted shoot tips and larval damaged stems with tunneling. However, this weevil is a very slow disperser. Prior to its release, climatic predictions were compiled and it was shown that the areas of the country where it was to be released were suitable for its establishment. This, the field results concurred with these predictions and the yellow stars show where it has established. Annual monitoring over the years determined that the weevil is present in at least 40% of the release sites. Um, not all release sites were sampled, but where it is, has been released, it is um, present at 40% of those sites. The recommendation is that additional releases are undertaken at new sites where it is not yet present as it is so localized, and in particular on young plants. The leaf feeding beetle, Zygogramma bicolorata, was also introduced in 2013, and about 65,000 beetles have been released at nearly 200 sites. However, there have been very few outbreaks of this um, beetle, and it is present at only a few sites. And where it was present, it caused extensive defoliation of plants, but over the years, it declined and is now absent. This is despite its earlier um, predictions that the areas where it was to be released were climatically suitable for the beetle, as indicated in the early um, establishment, showing where the yellow stars show where it had established in the early days. However, annual monitoring has shown a steady decline in this beetle and complete absence in recent years. So various studies have been undertaken to determine the cause of this um, of this uh, poor establishment. Um, and it's been shown that its thermal tolerance is affected by um, the age of the beetle, as well as whether it has fed or not. Um, there's very high egg predation in the field and plant quality um, compromises fecundity and larval development in low nutrient areas. Despite this, um, herbivory has been shown to decrease photosynthesis although the plants compensate with an upregulation of photosynthesis in, in adjacent leaves. But together, the leaf tissue um, removal, together with micro, microbe ingress, um, results in severe damage to the plants. So it is recommended at the moment that the release strategy is adapted and only very high numbers of the beetle are released at only sites with high rainfall as it has been shown that adult eclosion is severely hampered in dry soils. The Smicronix lutenensis seed feeding weevil was introduced in 2015. It, um, its larvae develop inside developing seeds, so it impacts on seed output. About 65,000 have been released at over 100 sites, and this weevil was um, not detected for about 10 years in Australia, where it has been used. Um, but in South Africa, it was detected soon after release and its um, establishment is, is continuing and its abundance is improving. Um, it is locally abundant at a few sites, um, at some sites, and it is causing extensive seed damage where it is present. Um, the recommendation for this agent is to continue the releases at sites at which it is not yet present. As these agents in general are fairly localized at the moment, it, it appears that additional agents are needed to be uh, utilized. So the stem galling moth, which was previously deprioritized due to host range, com host range complications, has been reintroduced into quarantine and is being tested for host specificity. It has, has good potential um, pending the, the outcome of these host range results. 
Carmenta, the root crown boring moth, tunnels in the, in the stems um, down to the root crown. It is very damaging, so has good potential, and it is also widespread where it has been released in Australia. Um, however, rearing difficulties have been um, experienced in South Africa, um, and the culture is not able to be sustained for long periods of time. So it will need to be re-imported and the host specificity tested. An impact study was undertaken um, using five meter square plots, 20 of them, with one meter square quadrats in which above and below ground variables were measured on a monthly or an annual basis. The results showed that within a single growing season, the Parthenium cover was reduced by a combination of agents. This was shown here where the insects and the rust fungi together significantly reduced, reduced the Parthenium cover. This was in comparison to the controls where there was no biological control agents and no reduction in cover. This is between the start and the end of the growing season. And in where there were insects used, there was a slight decline, although not significant. And in where there was the rust fungus, there was a significant decline in the, in the reduction, in the parthenium cover. So the combination of biocontrol agents resulted in the biggest decline in cover. Other research that's being undertaken in the project includes assessment, field assessments of Listronotus and Smicronix, as well as an assessment of the ant diversity and arthropod behavior in relation to parthenium and its biocontrol agent, Lystronotus. Also, the integration of biological control and in chemical control is being investigated and presented in other presentations in this conference. As parthenium is a global invader, several countries have called upon us to provide starter cultures, training, and in some cases, preliminary testing of other cultivars. In conclusion, the performance of the biocontrol agents is variable in space and time, and these, this is influenced by multiple factors, which are not always able to be predicted beforehand. In general, there is localized impact of the inter internal feeding insects and more widespread of the rust fungi. In combination, it's been shown that a combination of the agents um, has resulted in a greater reduction of the weed. So we do need multiple agents. Um, it is recommended that additional releases of the approved biocontrol agents is undertaken, um, are undertaken in areas where the agents are not yet present, and that additional agents are imported to assist to improve the level of biological control. And finally, collaboration is important as it will enhance the border control of this global invader. I'd like to acknowledge our funders, as well as all the individuals who have participated in this project. Thank you. Awesome. First session done and dusted. Thank you very much to all the speakers uh, for putting their videos up. I think we can all agree that was a very interesting session. Uh, I'd like to invite all of the speakers to be ready for questions. Uh, we have uh, a few questions for all of you. So for the next 10 or 15 minutes, we'll field some live questions. Um, to anyone who asked a question, if your question doesn't get answered live, uh, the speakers will get round to them eventually uh, in the Q&A box. So please don't feel left out. Um, the first question that I'd like to answer or answered is Megan, uh, Megan Reed. Um, do we know if the hybrids were introduced as is or did hybridization occur in the invaded range somewhere or in South Africa? Hi Guy, thanks for the, the question. Um, so uh, hybrids are known in the horticultural trade. Um, we suspect that many of the hybrids probably did come from the horticultural trade, but they have uh, recorded natural hybrids in the native range. Uh, we're not quite sure of the parentage just yet, but it's most likely horticulture. Okay, thank you. Uh, Megan, one more quick question for you is, um, did you determine the parent genotypes of uh, the hybrids in South Africa? Um, and how prevalent are these hybrids in, in South Africa? 
Okay, we, we haven't determined the parent genotypes yet. That is something I'm looking at doing um, as part of my, of my PhD. Um, and in terms of prevalence, uh, it seems at the, well, off the top of my head, like 50-50 from the original Mexicana versus the hybrids. But si I'm getting sites popping up all over the show. So it's, yeah, it's a work in progress. It's very interesting. Uh, the next question, Blair, um, what is the level of pushback or objections to Prosopis biocontrol by farmers in the Northern Cape? Uh, thanks, Guy. So there is actually a lot of engagement with quite a few stakeholder groups in the Northern Cape. So a lot of the decisions regarding biocontrol and the plans that go forward with agents, whether it be using seed feeders or the decision to evaluate more damaging agents is actually taken in those meetings. So they do engage stakeholders quite effectively. And there's a, a program or well, many programs, but a lot of that involvement comes with Philip Ivey. So he actively engages with many of those farmers and landowners in the Northern Cape. Yeah, thanks, Blair. Re really interesting talk. Thank you so much. Uh, Sivanati, can you be on standby? I'm going to find your question. Um, other than the candidates that you mentioned in your talk, uh, are there additional prospects in the native range? Like if these insects don't work out, are there more options for us for the Tamarix program? Um, yes, there are a couple of insects that are could be um, possible agents in North Africa. I can't remember necessarily the species names right now, but there are a couple of agents that we could test. The problem always comes with hybridization, the, the hybrids that do exist, and it's only 5% of them. The hybrids that do exist between um, Tamarix eusenoides and the exotic um, genotypes. And that's where we're trying to, you know, solve the problem. Sure. Okay. Well, it's good, good to know that there, there are more prospects for us in just in case we need them. Thanks so much for your talk. Uh, the next question is for uh, Kitani. Um, Kitani, can you tell us, do, do do tithonia and sunflower plants occur at the same sites, i.e. do they grow next to each other? And if they do, would there be a risk of spillover feeding from the biocontrol agents on tithonia into the sunflower fields? Thanks, Guy. Um, sunflower in South Africa is uh, commercially grown in the high field, while tithonia does foliar occurs in the subtropical regions of the country, that is Limpopo, um, Pumalanga, and KwaZulu Natal. So they don't actually grow uh, uh, side by side. They don't share the, the, kind, uh, the, the same area where, where the, the sun, sunflower is grown and where uh, Tithonia de Vesfole is invasive uh, are not uh, found in the same regions. However, uh, um, the risk of uh, spillover, more especially on the sunflower variety that uh, showed uh, some successful development, uh, can be ignored because that is one of the sunflower varieties that has been, um, they, they have stopped, uh, growing it commercially because uh, sunflower uh, uh, growers, they keep on changing varieties. That is the reason why we tested so many varieties. So uh, uh, with the, the risk of spillage, more um, if we, we suspect that the, 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 the agent might bring a risk to, to non-target plants or non-target uh, or high value crops like sunflower, we proceed further with more tests uh, that look at generation for several generations of the agent to see if the agent can really uh, um, continue to, 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 to have a population growing on, on, on that plant species to, in order to make sure that the agent that will be released will be safe. 
Perfect. Th thank you so much. Thanks for a, a really interesting talk. And uh, looks like the prospects for Tithonia Biocontrol are looking good. Thank you. Oh, okay. uh, th Thanks. The, the next question uh, is for Lalama. Um, Lalama, can you tell us, are there any uh, plans to encourage further or longer distance dispersal of matter polluter through direct intervention? Or is it just uh, localized to East London for now? Um, currently, the future plans is to conduct mass rearing um, and uh, do more releases in the areas where uh, mother is showing signs of establishment just to encourage um, more distribution of the agent. As you have noticed on the um, presentation, that made a polluter is a slow disperser. So the only the only way is mass rearing and more releases. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, and thanks for the interesting talk. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, Julie, is coming your way. Um, can you tell us, Julie, with the remote sensing, can you differentiate between the density of the mats and uh, I assume percentage coverage of those mats? Like, is there a possibility that we are like, can decouple the density from coverage? Um, Guy, I'm not clever enough to do those kind of calculations. So that's the work that David Kinsler's um, doing with his Macrophyte Viewer. He's got machine learning, and yes, you can differentiate between the density and the cover. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that question was from Samantha. Samantha, if you're look, looking for some more information, uh, I urge you to get in contact with David Kinsler then. Uh, he did present yesterday, and his email will be in the symposium booklet. Uh, thanks so much, Shiri. Um, one more question coming your way uh, is, do we know how long it will take us to exhaust the seed bank, uh, say at Heart of uh, Like what sort of time frame are we looking at before we start, um, we stop seeing these blooms every season? Yeah, it's a, I guess it's a thumb suck. I think for now, um, because there is such a high seed bank, um, each year we can expect to get regeneration of the, of the infestation. But our aim is to inundate these plants early in the season with control agents um, to get on top of the, the, the boom of, of plants. Um, and we're doing this by, we've set up a number of rearing stations all around the dam. I'm um, not just at Hodebeersport, but elsewhere, where we, where we hope to keep the, the agent populations high over, um, over winter, immediately release them. And hopefully with time, if we can um, get these insects onto the system, we prevent flowering, we prevent new seeds being added to the seed bank. Um, but I guess we can expect every spring for there to be a new um, flush of plants um, until we've depleted the seed bank. But we are doing seed bank studies to actually quantify this. So each year, hopefully we'll, we'll get fewer and fewer seeds. Cool. So hopefully we'll see some presentations at the next few conferences to, to answer that question. Cool, thank you so much. Um, and I think the, the last question for the, the live Q&A, um, Lorraine, is for you. Could, could you please tell us, is, is there a publicly available plan for the distribution of biocontrol agents on Parthenium? And if there is, how can we get public access to that? Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, that, so we've, Use the national strategy as a guideline for the releases um, in northern KZN and in Pumbalanga, where the infestations are the most dense and the most extensive. Um, and I think we now at a point, um, so that's guided where the, the regions where those have been released and, and released in a variety of different habitats. And we now at a point where we're starting to understand the behavior of the agents a little bit better and how they're performing in the field. So we're now starting to adapt the release strategies so we will replan um, how to go about the, the releases from here onwards. Okay. Okay. But you, sorry, can, Lorraine, the, uh, the current strategy, where, where could people find that if they want to read up? Um, is that available from you or can, so, could you maybe put a link in the chat or something like that? 
Yeah, there's not. I can send it through to to people. Um, it's okay. a PDF document that was approved by the Department of Environment Affairs, and okay. um, but it is being updated as well. Okay. Currently, Perfect. so. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, if if anyone is uh, interested in seeing that, please get in contact with Lorraine, and she'll be able to help you out. Cool. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Thanks, Pat. Excellent. Thank you so much to all the speakers again. That's going to be the end of our uh, discussion for the morning talks. Uh, we're going to proceed into uh, a poster session now. But before we go into the poster session, um, I'd just like to point everyone to something that's going to... There we go. It's already in the chat. Uh, Kim Weaver has put a, a link into the chat. Uh, it's just a small survey. Uh, that the conference organizers would like everyone to please take the time to, to fill out. We'd love to hear your uh, opinions of the conference. Um, and this information is going to help uh, the organizers to implement future events. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to answer the, the poll in the chat. And with that, let's go into a series of posters. So. Um, just to remind everyone, there will be no live Q&A for the poster session. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and the poster presenters, please will you get around to answering those, um, those questions by typing your answers out. Um, yeah, let's go into the poster session. Thank you so much, everyone. And then we'll go into a tea break. Good morning, my name is Daniel Rogers, and today I'll be talking about the suitability of a candidate biological control agent for an aquatic invasive plant, Sagittaria platyphylla, within South Africa. So as an invasive plant, Sagittaria platyphylla brings with it a lot of economic and ecological costs, and the weevil Listronotus frontalis is a candidate biological control agent of this invasive plant. So to better understand the populations of Sagittaria within South Africa, various surveys were set up and it was found that of the sites sampled, only one did not have any tubers within it. And the highest number of tubers recorded per meter squared was one, which is just shy of 100 at a site in the Western Cape. When water depth and seasonality were looked at in terms of their influence on tuber production, they weren't found to have a significant influence on, on the production of tubers. However, tuber production was found to significantly differ between sites sampled. So an impact study was set up to determine the level of damage that adult Listronotus frontalis provided to Sagittaria platyphylla plants. And of the 11 recorded plant parameters, 10 of these were found to be significantly reduced with the presence of this weevil. So just to conclude, in the study, we have shown that tubers are a very important life stage for Sagittaria platyphylla populations within South Africa, and thus they need to be controlled, whether chemically, mechanically, biologically, or through an integrated control approach. And more work is, is needed to determine the suitability and to determine if um, Listronotus frontalis can be released to aid in this process. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ekona Zozo, and I'm going to be sharing with you on the biological control of C. pallida in South Africa. C. pallida, like other Cylindropantia species, is an alien invasive cactus in South Africa. These cacti are closely associated with Dactylopias tomentosus cochineal, which are used for their control. D. tomentosus has different biotypes. So the aim of this study was to determine whether the biotypes already in use for other Cylindropantia species in South Africa could control C. pallida or if a new agent should be considered. This was achieved by assessing the development and impact of the Chola and Imbricata biotypes already released in South Africa. The effect of hybridization of the two cochineal biotypes on their biocontrol work was also assessed. The methods we used were as follows. For the cochineal development trials, we had the treatments as follows. 
Firstly, each cochineal biotype scrollers were introduced onto C. pallida and their host cactus species. And secondly, each cochineal biotype scrollers were introduced on the non-host cactus species. From this, a fitness index for the cochineal biotypes was calculated. For the cochineal impact assessment, cladodes infested with cochineal biotypes were placed in cages with a single potted plant from C. pallida, C. fulgida vamamilata, and C. imbricata. The setup of the experiment for hybridization was as follows. There was a control with no cochineal introduced. There was a hybridization treatment with three potted plants from C. pallida, C. fulgida vamamilata, and C. imbricata with both cochineal biotypes introduced. And then there was an imbricata cochineal only treatment. And lastly, a chola cochineal only treatment. The results and conclusions we received were as follows. Both the imbricata and chola biotypes had fitness indices less than one on Cylindropantia pallida, which means that they did survive but not thrive on this plant. They also did not kill this plant since they had no impact on its health. The hybridization of the cochineal appears to have resulted in enhanced fitness, which meant better control of all three cacti. From these, we conclude that a new agent is needed for Cylindropantia pallida in South Africa and the release of D. tomentosus californica vapakeri, which has worked effectively on C. pallida in Australia, is necessary. Thank you. Hyperophorus, an aggressive wheat native to the Americas that has invaded numerous countries worldwide, including South Africa. The wheat impacts severely on biodiversity, our culture production and health, and was therefore targeted with biological control. Smicnix sutilensis is a small seed feeding weevil that it was intentionally released in South Africa to manage the weed. A single larvae feeds within a developing seed, destroying it and reducing the number of viable seeds per capitulum. From November 2019 to November 2020, the seasonal dynamics of Smicnix Vesalensis field populations were evaluated to gain insight into the weevil's abundance and efficacy, and to investigate the influence of climatic variables in the weevil's performance. Monthly sampling was undertaken using 10 randomly placed quadrats at three weevil established sites each in Mpumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal provinces. The national lockdown prevented winter sampling. Counts of all weevil life stages were recorded in the field and by floral dissections. On each sampling occasion, 25 flower buds per plant and a maximum of 10 flowering plants per quadrat were inspected for immature stages. Although established, weevil numbers were lower at some sites. Adults and immatures were more abundant at sites in Pumalanga than in KwaZulu-Natal. In general, populations increased from November to February and declined thereafter. The presence of a single larva often observed to cause abortion of adjacent seeds within the capitulum. Importantly, this indicates that low weevil populations may have a relatively high impact on seed reduction. Further analyses in the study will assess the influence of climatic variables and efficacy of the weevil. Elsewhere, the weevil has only been used in Australia, which was not detected for the first decade after release. So this will provide insight into the early field performance and form a baseline for future evaluations. This knowledge also indicates appropriate timing for monitoring to determine whether impacts increase with time, as well as collection for redistribution into new areas once weevil abundance improves. Please allow me to review about possible factors contributing to the low efficacy of Aristothalasius in the field. Aristothalasius is a biological control agent of Leptospermum lavigatum, one of the problematic and aggressive weeds in the Feinbos region. In an attempt to manage the weed, two biological control agents were introduced decades ago, a gall forming mage and a leaf mining moth. And currently, the, a the impact of both agents is negligible. This influenced the aim of the study to determine if mortality is a contributing factor to the low efficacy of the agent. In trying to understand the moth, this study looked into the developmental biology of the moth to understand if it's able to complete its life cycle on its host, and also to determine if the moth is prone to mortality and what stages are most prone to mortality. And lastly, to understand the overposition pattern and egg abundance of the moth in the field. This study was carried out for a period of 18 months in Stanford, where leaves are were collected and inspected of live and dead larvae, prepupae, and pupae. The developmental biology study was carried out in Stellenbosch. The egg abundance was done by collecting um, leaves 
of leptospermum levigatum bearing viable eggs. Parasitism, predation, and overcrowding was measured as a possible cause of mortality. The study showed that the moth is able to complete its life cycle, taking about an average of 59 days. The results also showed that the moth is experiencing high levels of mortality. However, parasitism, predation and overcrowding were too low to account for high levels of mortality in the field. It was also observed that there was a possibility of a mismatch between the host plant and the agent with oviposition peaking at the end of the plant growing season. In conclusion, the moth is able to complete its life cycle. However, it is experiencing high levels of mortality, in particular, the mining stage and the pre-pupal stage. Although the possible causes of mortality could not be verified, the mismatches of phenologies as well as the plant's ability to compensate for the impact of the agent could be contributing to the underperformance of the agent in the field. I thank you. My name is Yasang Mnita, and my research topic is enhancement of megamela scutellaries by naturally occurring phytopathogens for biological control of water hyacinth. Phytopathogens, specifically fungi, have a potential to be used as bioherbicides to control invasive weeds. However, for a weed as invasive as water hyacinth, these bioherbicides need to be supplemented with other control methods, such as combination with insect control agents. For this reason, the aim for this study was to enhance the performance of a currently used insect agent, Megamela scutellaris, with disease causing indigenous fungi for improved biocontrol of water hyacinth. The fungi were isolated from diseased water hyacinth leaves, and the three most pathogenic fungi were identified as Fusarium equisetae, Fusarium oxysporum, and Fusarium incarnatum and they were selected for combination impact studies with Megamela scutellaris. Significant differences were observed in plant damage caused by different combinations of fungi and Megamela scutellaris. This research study demonstrated that these three native fungal isolates have a detrimental impact on water hyacinth under controlled environmental conditions. And when combined with Megamela scutellaris, Fusarium equisetae and Fusarium incarnatum showed increased detrimental impacts on water hyacinth compared to when the agent was applied individually suggesting synergistic and enhanced control impacts of the agents on water hyacinth. Thank you. Acoceros Janus, commonly known as torch cactus, is a cactus that is native to Argentina and has become an increasing concern in South Africa. Invasions create dense populations, which decreases grazing area for livestock and wildlife. Although previous records indicate that this cactus is native to northwestern Argentina, no wild populations were observed during surveys carried out in this region in 2019. The control of this cactus using mechanical and chemical control measures are challenging, and thus the development and implementation of a biological control program is imperative. Currently, no biological control program for this cactus exists. A gall-forming millibug in the genus Hypogeococcus has successfully been used to control cactus species closely related to T. spatianus and is used presently as an effective biological control agent against various cactus species. Although this Hypogeococcus can survive on T. spatianus, establishment on and damage to the plant is insufficient to result in control. Thus, this research aims to identify potential new Hypogeococcus that may serve as an effective agent against T. spatianus in South Africa. Last year, six hypogeococcus entities were collected from a variety of cactus in Argentina. These insects were imported into quarantine and their damage potential against T. spatianus is being assessed. Should any of these entities record an acceptable level of damage, then host specificity of this insect will be further investigated and if found to be host specific, considered for release in South Africa. Dear colleagues, I'm Ruzura Mukwebo and I will be presenting to you the efficacy of light intensity 
on the inflorescence production and efficacy of bud nipping mite, which is a serial in South Africa. The weed has continuously threatened biodiversity on agricultural, natural, and forest ecosystem around the globe. And irrespective of the efforts invested towards development of biological control agents, the weed has continuously spread to new ranges through seeds and vegetative propagules. In this study, we assessed the impact of light intensity on the overall reproductive output of the plant. And we have also assessed the impact of uh, light intensity on the efficacy of lantana, a serial lantana. Sampling was done at different uh, regions, which is the low field and high field regions of Malanga, and the plants were sampled under three habitats, which is shaded, partly shaded, and as well, full sun. Among the sample parameters were the inflorescence um, production, the fruiting rates, uh, as well as uh, uh, the performance of a cereal antenna. Both uh, inflorescence uh, production and, and the performance of a cereal antenna varied between different um, eco zones and as well as between um, different uh, shade regimes. However, the fruiting rate did not vary between either the regions or three treatments. There has been as well a relationship between the shading regimes or light intensity with all the reproductive outputs or parameters measured and as well with the performance of Acerea lantani. However, the seeding rate did not correlate with the light intensity. Therefore, I would say the performance of Acerea lantani has responded to different um, light intensities as well as the reproductive output of the plant. However, we recommend that going forward, the host quality should be measured to ascertain the reproductive output and efficacy of a serial lantern. I thank you. Presentation is about stats of aquatic weeds associated with biological control agents in Southern Mozambique River. Biological control is an effective way of controlling aquatic weeds. In 2009, the percentage cover of Salvinia, Pistia, Azola, and Water Yassin was estimated in seven rivers situated in Southern Mozambique. 100 plants each, Salvinia, Pistia, and Salvinia as well, were collected to quantify the presence of biological control agents. In addition, 10 plants of water hyacinth were inspected for neoctina species and other biological control. As a result, we saw that Salvinia was the less problematic weeds confined to two rivers in the North Torbargo Salvinia. Pistia was found in three rivers, but the Neohydronum starting was found only in two rivers. Azola cristata was the second most problematic weed found in four rivers in higher percentage cover. Stenopalmus rufinase was found in small numbers. What I think was the most problematic weed found in all the river except in one river, with the higher percentage of cover reaching 95%. Neocutina aichormiae and the Neocutina brush were present. Other biological control, such as pathogen and the fungs, fungs were found. In conclusion, we can say that the most aquatic weeds in Southern Mozambique were what I think, and the Azola Cristata. It is recommended that the number of biological control agents should be added and the monitoring.
civil society plant surveys and biological control research working together. South Africa has over a century of safe use of biological control to manage invasive plants. Researchers have relied heavily on the Southern African Plant Invader Atlas to provide accurate data on distribution of invasive species. This project ended in 2019. The Botanical Society has members who are keen to gather data on invasive species. Can we use this data to improve biological control implementation? We aim to ensure the maintenance and availability of data, advocate greater use of biological control, encourage observation and recording of invasive alien species and biocontrol agents on iNaturalist, make better use of iNaturalist data, and give annual commentary on progress. We found that in South Africa, 143 safe biological control agents have been released on 48 plant species. 94 agents are established and 52 have had considerable impact. Three iNaturalist projects record 290 invasive alien plant species with over 37,000 observations. Relatively few observers record the majority of observations. iNaturalist had observations for only 30 of the 94 established biocontrol agents. Although there are many observations of invasive alien plants, there are far fewer of associated biological control agents. Distribution plans for biocontrol agents are based on observation records. With sustainable and sufficient funding and collaboration with stakeholders, the following could be delivered. Maintenance of legacy data for wider use, raised awareness of the need to observe both invasive alien plant species and biocontrol agents, use of iNaturalist data to plan biological control programs, and finally, the sharing of biological control plans and progress reports with a broader audience of stakeholders. Thank you. Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to the second biocontrol session for the morning. I hope that you all have your teas and coffees in hand and ready to go for another exciting session of biocontrol talks. Uh, before we get there, just a quick reminder, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to as many of these as we can during the live session. And if we don't, uh, the speakers will answer your questions afterwards uh, by typing their answers in the text box. Before we get to the next few biocontrol talks, uh, there have been a few requests for the recordings uh, of the, the slides this morning and talks. Um, these will be made publicly available to everyone. Uh, Kim Weaver will send uh, a link this afternoon via email. So if you are interested, the, the recordings will be made available. So without further ado, let's get into mm -hmm. the next set of bar control talks. Enjoy everyone. Jewelers of loam feeders, who takes the biggest bite out of water hyacinth under elevated CO2 conditions? This was an insect feeding yield response study under elevated CO2 conditions, with chewing insects being represented by corn aquaticum, semi-aquatic grasshopper, uh, specific to water hyacinth, and phloem feeders being represented by Megamela scutellaris, a very successful agent for water hyacinth. Diving straight into uh, plant response to elevated CO2 can be broken up into two forms. Short term responses, which is increases in photosynthetic rate, stimulated growth in biomass production, and uh, altering of plant chemistry. Whereas long term response to elevated CO2 is the acclimation of some of these mechanisms, specifically photosynthetic mechanisms, to have cascading effects onto. Um, some of the other aspects of the plant quality as well as chemical compounds. So this issue of um, changes in long-term to short-term is often associated with resource supply, where resources such as nitrogen and phosphorus are limited in certain environments and the plants are not able to produce or gain such a stimulated response uh, under elevated CO2 conditions. This is not thought to be the case with water hyacinth because of the nutrient-rich waters in South Africa. Plant responses, insects also have a anticipated yield response. However, insects are not directly affected 
by changes in CO2, but plant quality is. So it's changes in plant quality which have cascading effects onto insect physiology. But changes in plant quality are not the only thing that happens. There is also changes in secondary chemical compounds, such as altering the jasmonic and psilocybic acid production, which have impacts on, on many insects, specifically chewers. Um, responses, however, to this can be different from species to species, but there's a general trend that holds true. So chewing insects experiencing increase in feeding or a compensatory feeding response and experiencing larval fitness decline, such as larval weight and, and size. Our flown feeders don't seem to experience much of an increase in feeding. However, population densities do significantly increase. Took place at the Rhodes University's elevated CO2 facility, uh, the largest in Africa, with uh, the study using 800 and 400 parts per million. Uh, 800 chosen as the IPCC's uh, RCP 8.5, which is the worst case scenario, and 400 is chosen as the ambient CO2, which is what we're currently sitting at. Uh, the study produced some very interesting results. Much like previous studies, this is an ACI curve, which is an assimilation versus intercellular CO2 curve. Um, control plants were shown to actually acclimate their photosynthetic mechanisms down to ambient levels or slightly below that. However, when exposed to insect herbivory, this was slightly stimulated at 400, and there was a significant decline in this photosynthetic mechanism at 800 parts per million, specifically for the flown feeding megametoscute larvae. The same pattern was seen in total biomass accumulation at the time, with 400 and 800 showing no difference with the control, while there was a compensatory growth response when insect herbivory was introduced specifically at 800 parts per million. Insect responses were not what we were expecting. Uh, the chewing insect actually had no feeding response due to elevated CO2. There was no change in how much damage was associated with 400 and 800 parts per million. However, populations of Megamelis with Lara still experienced this, this flown feeders response by increasing population density by nearly 85% at elevated CO2 and still having a significant impact on the simulation rates of water highs, uh, simulation rates of CO2 at water highs. Now, to answer the question, who takes the biggest bite out of water highs, it's a little bit tricky, but we see that water hyacinth had this compensatory growth response of herbivory or from herbivory at elevated CO2. And there was no seeming to be any change with the chewing response of, of Quantum at elevated CO2. Unfortunately, we didn't have population level responses because of the, the lifespan of the insect in the time of the study. However, chewing insects in general seem to respond negatively to um, elevated CO2. And there's often a generational or long-term generational response that is negative uh, with declines in, in population fitness. While Bloom feeders seem to experience this, this phenomenal increase in population density and are still impactful on the photosynthetic mechanism at elevated CO2. So to answer the question, who would take the biggest bite? May in fact be the humble phloem feeder, which attacks directly the, the photosynthetic mechanisms. And when accumulate over a shorter period in higher densities, may in fact be a, a very successful agent at elevated CO2. And future biological control programs may actually need to shift their focus away from the charismatic foliables that we see so often and maybe focus more on these flown feeding agents, which are showing promise at elevated CO2 conditions. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosalie Smith. I'm from the Center for Biological Control, and I'll be giving an update on the status of Egeria denser in South Africa. If you were wondering what I look like, I'm the person with the long hair in that photo. So Egeria densa is also known as Brazilian waterweed. It is a submerged aquatic weed that reproduces asexually in South Africa. This allows it to quickly form dense monoculture stands in the systems where it is present. And currently it is most invasive in the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu-Natal provinces. Its biological control agent is Hydrelia egeriae. It is a leaf and stem mining fly. It is mostly the immatures that damage the plant. Adults live on the water surface. Females oviposit eggs on leaves that stick out of the water. And when the eggs hatch, the instars um, will enter a leaf 
between the epidermal layers where it will feed on the photosynthetic tissue. The fly was released for the first time in South Africa in October 2018 in the Nahoon River um, in East London in the Eastern Cape. On that day, we released approximately 10,000 individuals. We only did one release because we wanted to see what the effect would be of one release versus multiple releases on the establishment and effectiveness of the biological control agent. In the following months after the release, we saw, we saw an increase in the field population. It reached a maximum of nearly 1,250 images per kilogram Egeria denser in the river in September 2019, after which the population declined. It is currently present in low field um, population numbers. Looking at um, the herbivory levels, the herbivory levels within the Nahoon River were almost negligent um, as it did not um, even reach um, 0.25% of a Egeria denser shoot that were damaged. We also saw that through linear modeling that herbivory did not significantly reduce Egeria dense biomass, but also we saw that other aquatic macrophytes um, outcompeted Egeria densa, as the system is now dominated by water hyacinth and hornhort. We also did releases in the Midmar Dam in KwaZulu Natal. We did multiple releases at this site. We released at the three um, red circles. Um, and in 2018, Egeria Denser covered approximately 41% of this site. Looking at the field population after release, um, after its first release, um, there was um, establishment as well as a maximum of nearly 2,500 images per kilogram Egeria denser, which is um, higher compared to the Nahoon River. Looking at herbivory levels, herbivory levels were nearly 27 times more compared to the Nahoon River, um, and it reached 25% of an Egeria denser shoot that was damaged by the fly. Through linear modeling, we also saw that Hydrelia Egeria mining did not significantly reduce Egeria denser biomass. And by the end of last year, we saw that Egeria denser increased its coverage at the release site. From the last two years, we have learned that augmentative releases are important. But also we've learned that there are other factors within these systems that affect Egeria denser biological control. For example, high nutrient levels, which promote um, macrophyte growth. There were also competition from other aquatic macrophytes. But a very important result was learning that the biological control agent is experiencing parasitism, We've identified three native parasitoids that um, affect Hydrelia egeriae. For example, in the Nahoon River, parasitism levels were on average 23%, and within the Midmar Dam, 53%. Moving forward, we can now apply what we've, what we've learned within the last two years. Um, we can now we now know that augmentative releases are important and we are already applying this within um, Egeria denser invaded sites, for example, the Bavians Kluwef in the Eastern Cape. We also know that um, parasitism is lower in the summer months and um, we can now focus on releasing biological control agents in the warmer months. Thank you. 
Good day, everyone. Greetings from Stellenbosch all the way in Cape Town. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present the findings of a post-release evaluation study that I've been conducting in the past eight years, where I've been collecting long-term data sets uh, on the efforts or the efficacy of biological control for the management of two alien invasive acacia species native to Australia. So these two alien invasive acacias are the longleaf wattle, as well as the Sydney golden wattle, acacia longifolia and acacia pignantha respectively. As of today, people still see extensive thickets of these species in uh, riparian zones as well as mountain habitats. And uh, it's easy to, to conclude that biological control is not working. But however, it should be noted that the biological control agents that we use uh, for the management of these species are species seed destroyers. In other words, they preclude, their job is to preclude reproduction and uh, they leave the, the uh, vegetative plant parts of these infestations intact because of the conflict of interest with uh, the biological management of alien invasive acacias, which also have economic significance. So this is a picture of Banok Valley all the way in Stellenbosch, where you have got um, the riparian zone in the valley floor uh, to your left, as well as an adjacent mountain habitat, which was also infested with acacia longifolia. And the problems associated with uh, alien invasive acacias cannot be overemphasized. Fire is one of the biggest problems. Recently in the Western Cape, there was a fire that almost destroyed Table Mountain and the University of Cape Town. And uh, the, the usual um, negative impacts that they have on our water resources. So for the biological control against this species, what we have is insect goformers in the genus uh, Trichilogaster and the biocontrol program started in 1970s, which is a first for biological control as these were the first agents to be deployed against a perennial uh, alien invasive species. To complement the activity of these pioneering bad galling wasps, we, uh, we also have malentarius weevils. These are seed destroyers from the genus Malentarius. So our post-release evaluation program has been guided by the aim which was to assess the efficacy of seed destroyers in reducing reproductive fitness of invasive acacias. And we followed a set of three simple objectives. The first one being to monitor the post-release biocontrol, uh, the post-biocontrol seed drain, as well as to measure the extent of existing soil seed banks, as well as to estimate seed mortality due to weevil damage. And to achieve this, we did seed drain, we did seed damage assessments, as well as measured the extent of the existing soil seed banks. And the results we're getting from historical records, we know that over 45,800 seeds per square meter were in the soil. And that has since gone down to an average of about 246, 874 seeds per square meter in the Western Cape, KwaZulu Natal, for the mountain habitats for which Acacia longifolia is invaded. And in the riparian zone, we've got about 1,000 in the Western Cape to over 8,000 in KwaZulu Natal. As for Acacia pycnantha, only occurs in low lying fine boss biomes, and uh, we've had as low as 347 to 800 to 8,768 per square meter. When we look at uh, uh, the seed production versus weevil damage, we see that the historical records put seed rain at over 7,600, and uh, now that has been reduced to just between six and 636 per square meter in riparian zones, as well as 10 to 450 in the Montana. When we look at the seed damage, it is falling anywhere between 15% to 80% in riparian zones and 20 to 70% in the mountain uh, zones. For Acacia pycnantha, historical records are lacking, but however, seed drain is between 14 and 100 seeds per square meter in the Western Cape, and 90 to about 240 in the Eastern Cape. We're looking at seed drain, seed damage, it is falling between 3% and 30% in the Eastern Cape and the Western Cape respectively. So what do our results tell us? First of all, when we look at the historical records, which were over 45,000 seeds to the current uh, 300 and uh, little over 1,000 seeds per square meter, we see that there's a significantly low number of seeds that are available in the soil today compared to what it was in the past. And when we look at the different habitats on which the invasions occur, 
there's significantly less seeds in the mountains, which explains why these are no longer a problem in mountain zones compared to the riparian zones. This obviously can be attributed to the soil moisture and the nutrients that are available in riparian zones. In the case of Apic Nantha, the absence of pre biocontrol records um, makes it difficult for us to make a comparison. But however, the data we see is comparable to what we are seeing with the acacia longifolia. Now, looking at seed drain versus weevil damage, for both species, there is variability between sites and across seasons in terms of podging and weevil damage. The performance of the weevils is influenced by their survivorship under inconsistent fluctuations uh, in seed set as well as climatic factors that um, affect the growth pattern of the host plants, as well as the um, contribution of um, uh, parasitoids in the system. So the consequences of these inconsistent seed levels are that in years of low seed production, you've got low numbers of malentarious larvae produced, which then causes population crashes, low survival rates of the pre pupae and very few adults emerging in the next generation. And then annual variation in seed damage, it is low when pods are abandoned after a year with uh, low pod production. So in other words, where there are too few adults for seeds available. And uh, in high years, uh, high in years with few pods following years with abandoned pods. So in other words, in a, where there's a surplus of adults relative, uh, relative to the numbers of seeds available, you see also high levels of seed damage. So in conclusion, we can safely say that biological control is working. There is a significant reduction in seed rate as well as seed, um, seed bank, uh, extent of the seed bank versus historical records. And this can only be attributed to the presence of biological control. Overall, when we look at the malinterious weevils, uh, in as much as the tricular gaster wasps uh, are playing the biggest role in the biological control, uh, the weevils uh, are now well adapted and efficient backup agents, and their impacts accrue over time, and uh, basically playing their part in reducing the reproductive capacity of the weeds. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, my name is Naoji Katembo from the Agricultural Research Council. My talk is on the impact of biocontrol on the seed regenerative capacity of Lantana Camara in South Africa. Originally from South to Central America, Lantana was first introduced into South Africa in the mid 1800s as an ornamental plant. It is distributed along the warm, humid, temperate part of the country. Some varieties of lantana are highly toxic to livestock. The weed poses a serious threat to biodiversity, reducing grazing land and uh, encroaching on arable land, ultimately threatening food security. This is a weed of environmental and economic importance, especially owing to the fact that it is highly prolific. And so the study aim was to measure for the first time the combined impact of all biocontrol agents on the seed regenerative capacity of lantana in inland South Africa. The study site lie along the Sabi River catchment in the province of Mpumalanga near the towns of Khaskop, Sabi, and Heavyview. All sites were along uh, or adjacent to eucalyptus plantations. Biocontrol agents that were prominent in the study area included Assyria lantana, Hypinella serratalis, Octotomas cabipenis, Ophemia camara, Elonima scrupulosa, and Europata viragi. Then 50 by 20 meter plots were used in this experiment. Within each plot, a pair of four by four meter quadrat was set up. Vegetation within each quadrat was clear to the ground and two centrally located stumps of lantana were tagged from where parameters were measured. One quadrat was to be kept biocontrol free through the use of a systemic soil applied insecticide called carbofuran, and the other quadrat was to be kept biocontrol infested. In total, we had 20 biocontrol and 20 exclusion plants. Parameters measured in this experiment included seed production, which was seed count per plant. It was taken at the end of the experiment in 2016 through destructive sampling. 
Seed drain density was measured through the use of seed traps. Soil seed bank density. Here, soil samples were taken from within exclusion and biocontrol quadrat, taken to the lab at Vet University, and were emptied in germination trays. Using the emergence uh, method, germination was used as proxy for soil seed bank density. And seedling density was uh, taken through count of seedlings per quadrat at all the nine sampling seasons. There were no significant differences between biocontrol and exclusion plants in seed production, as well as seed drain density. However, the overall seed drain density was significantly higher in the exclusion compared to biocontrol plants. There were no significant differences uh, in between biocontrol and exclusion quadrat in soil seed bank, as well as seedling density. In conclusion, the impact of, or the combined impact of all biocontrol agents on the seed regenerative capacity of Lantana in this inland area was relatively small, but it was in the right direction. Therefore, the ad additional biocontrol agents that are better suited to the cooler, high altitude inland environment are required. Integrated weed management of Lantana is the best control measure thus far. Thank you. Good day, everyone. My name is Zeza Chumata. I'm a PhD candidate at the Center for Biocontrol. Today, I'll be presenting to you on mass rearing, releasing, and monitoring of biological control agents on invasive alien cactus plants. Invasive alien cactus plants are prominent in South Africa. These plants are problematic because they pose a threat to indigenous biodiversity and agricultural productivity. They form dense impenetrable thickets, they reduce land clearing capacity, and they are harmful to livestock, wildlife, as well as humans due to the spines that they have. In this picture, there is jointed cactus, which is one of invasive alien cactus plants. Joined cactus is divided into segments which are called cladwoods. The plant has numerous spines that are harmful. Luckily, there are biological control agents that are released to reduce the densities as well as the negative impacts of cactus invasive plants. There is hypogeococcus and cochineal biotypes as biological control agents for cactus invasive alien plants. These biological control agents are very effective in reducing the densities of cactus invasive plant, but they are poor dispersers and they need human intervention to reach out to distant and isolated infestations. The Center for Biocontrol Mestriers biological control agents for cactus invasive alien plants and makes it possible for releases to be conducted throughout South Africa. The aim of the study was to evaluate the impact of these biological control agents through long-term monitoring and questionnaire studies. For methods, long-term monitoring of agent and weed populations in the field were conducted through setting up permanently marked transits and marking individual plants within infestations that were monitored. Questionnaires were conducted to evaluate the perceptions of land users about biocontrol efficacy in South Africa. Long-term monitoring results. There were four cactus invasive alien plants that have been targeted by the CDC. Opantia orientiaca was the first one. We have two Y axes. The number of cladus per meter square on one side. On the other side, percentage cautionary infested cladus per meter square. On X axis, there's time of monitoring. There was a reduction in the number of cladwoods, and there was an increase in the percentage cautionary infested cladwoods per meter squared during the time of monitoring. For Opantia monocanta, there was a reduction in the number of cladwoods and fruits, and there was an increase in the percentage cautionary infested cladwoods per plant during the time of monitoring. For Opantia stricta, 
there was a decrease in the number of shadows and fruits per plant. There was an increase in the percentage of cochineal infested per plant during the time of monitoring. For Selenropantia imbricata, there were three plant parameters, plant height, plant width, and number of shadows. There was a slight decrease in all plant parameters, and there was a significant increase in the percentage of cochineal infested cladus per plant during the time of monitoring. For the questionnaire study results, there were four questions that were chosen from the questionnaire. On Y axis, there's percentage of participants. On X axis, there's responses of participants. There are different colors indicating different responses of participants. More than 80% of the, of the participants have perceived the biological control to have reduced the amount of cactus invasive alien plants on their land. Close to 50% of participants believed that there was a decrease in the harm caused by the invasive alien cactus plants on their land. More than 90% of the participants they have perceived biocontrol to be the safe, safest method that is used to control invasive alien cactus plants on their land. More than 90% of the participants have said that they would recommend biological control to fellow colleagues. In conclusion, biocontrol of invasive alien plants is effective when mass rearing, redistribution, and monitoring are included in the management, start, in the management strategy. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Samuel Mkitwe, and I'm here at Rhodes University. I'm affiliated with the CBC Center for Biological Control. Um, today, I'd like to share some of our findings um, where we look at biodiversity recovery, ecosystem recovery, and restoration um, following invasive alien aquatic plant species management. And I really um, hope you find this quite interesting. Um, so the role of macrophytes in aquatic system is, is quite important, and this can be viewed in two ways. Um, they are both uh, 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 functional and also structural. Structurally important, um, they provide um, surfaces for phytoplankton, periphyton development. They themselves are also part of the food web, where they fuel um, um, trophic food web systems of these aquatic uh, systems. Um, they're important for nutrient retention and cycling. Um, structurally, they also provide habitat complexity or habitat shelter, if you can say. Um, for fish, uh, microvertebrates, and um, some um, zooplankton species. So they're quite important uh, within the systems. And I have a background a picture at the back there. It's not really a South African um, example, but really gives an idea um, how these microfats are important within the systems. However, um, it's a different case when we have invasive in aquatic plants that are invading our freshwater systems. And we know that um, this uh, free floating, particularly, they block sunlight for the underwater life of, of freshwater systems, and that on its own reduces bite of air, reduces sorry, um, uh, phyto, uh, photosynthesis of the system, and that has uh, knock on effects on the ecosystem productivity, where we have less um, phytoplankton and periphyton production, and also um, no subsidy within the systems because both phytoplankton and submerged aquatic um, plant species, they subsidize the aquatic food web. So there's no resource that have been pushed up higher to the food web. So that also uh, puts the system under pressure. Um, the structure of the system and the function is compromised because now with no subsidy going up and down the food web, uh, the biological and functional diversity is compromised. That, that leads to reduction in biodiversity, reduction in ecosystem, goods and services that we normally get from these um, freshwater systems. In South Africa, we have these three methods to control alien invasive aquatic plant species. Um, and for particular for this study, we really want to look at um, this framework that was once proposed by Reed et al. to say we have these resources that we use to manage this um, aquatic weeds in this case, um, either mechanical, um, chemical, or biological control. But we desire that after control, we want to see this ecosystem recovery happening, meaning increase in biodiversity, increase in aquatic plants, um, good water quality, 
Um, and uh, we should be able to have a monitoring system in place to really look at these coming forth. And if that's the case, we will see an improvement in aquatic biodiversity and ecosystem functioning, and we can get these goods and services back from the system. So it's quite important, and we're really going to try and uh, apply this framework within our examples. <clears throat> we had a study that we looked at Salvinia molesta biological Call control in a user cousins um, setting, where we had uh, three treatments. Treatment one impacted, 100% covered with Salvinia molesta the whole time. Um, for six weeks, 60 weeks, we had an open water, no salvinia molesta, no cytobega salvinia for about 60 weeks, and we had the restored treatment where we tested um, salvinia molesta and cytobega salvinia, uh, which is the biological control agent. We looked at, um, on sickly, sick weekly basis, we looked at perifatin diversity and also aquatic microinvertebrates using those artificial um, substrates. So what we saw that was, um, that the open water for both richness, abundance, and, and diversity was quite high because there's no obstruction for sunlight and disruption for um, uh, perifatin and, 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 and phytoplankton and development. So aquatic microinvertebrates were quite high. They were quite happy in all cases. But when you look at um, the impacted where it was 100% salvinia, there was a drastic decline um, for richness, abundance, and also relative um, um, also for diversity, that really shows that the presence of salvinia molesta 100% covered the systems would have a drastic decline in aquatic biodiversity. But when you look at the restored, where we had salvinia molesta and the biocontrol, um, it was a little bit in the middle, but ultimately we saw an increase mimicking the reference or mimicking the clear water um, state. Also, this really shows that these systems, when they are controlled, um, there's a potential for them to recover their biodiversity and hopefully we can also recover in terms of the ecosystem structure and functions. So what do we draw from here? Um, biological indicators are important, which is aquatic microinvertebrates, and we see biocontrol play, playing a role in terms of seeing the recovery of, of, of aquatic biodiversity. We compared this study with that of Kutsier and we got similar results as shown in these two graphs. Now, we wanted to take this from the mesocosms to the field to really see if what we see in mesocosms really comes and plays a role. And here we wanted to look at a whole lake um, um, system based where we can collect evidence and also look at the food web structure and the structural function of the system. And the better way to do this is to take your experiments to the field. So we had four study sites. Um, the two study sites, West Lake and Silver uh, Empowerment, where in uh, the city of Cape Town. Here we came and did um, uh, microinvertebrate survey, phytoplankton survey, and nutrient survey before we introduced biological control agents. Unfortunately, after we introduced biological control agents, um, a month or two down the line, the city of Cape Town um, uh, mechanically removed um, Salvina Molesta from these systems. So now we came back and only um, did the after mechanical control to look at the biodiversity recovery um, between these two sites. We had two more sites, one in Limpopo and one in Kochmas Kloof, the Brady River. Um, fortunately, here we were able to test the biological control. So we came and did the survey before um, uh, biological control. We released about 10,000 salvage site of Vega Salvini on each site. And um, um, about 16 months later, uh, or 18 months later, we saw successful biological control of Salvina Molesta. Now, we wanted to look at the ecosystem structure and functioning, and we used stable isotopes of um, aquatic microinvertebrates, perifitin, and fish that we found in the system both before and after. So the before, it's the red dots um, with the red circle, and the after uh, Salvina Molesta control is the black dots with the black circle. So each area of each cycle represent um, an aquatic food web um, structure. Um, so the bigger the cycle, the bigger the energy resources in the systems, the more the interactions of aquatic organisms and the higher the diversity. And you can see from the before, the red to the after, there's an increase in the cycle size, indicating that following biological control and mechanical control on some of the sites, there was an increase in the trophic food web structure and interactions, meaning 
we see biodiversity coming back, but that, that, that biodiversity also contributed to the ecosystem recovery. So clearly, in this case, if you want to test the ecosystem recovery, we cannot use um, biological or we'll say biodiversity indices, but we need to go in depth, look at how the interactions within the animals themselves um, plays a role. So we move away from the traditional um, diversity richness to more of food webs and interactions. And this clearly shows us following biological control and mechanical control, there was an increase in the um, food web structure. So in conclusion, we see that these freshwater systems have the ability to recover soon after we control the invasive species, can be either biologically or mechanically, but also we see this whole system and evidence-based indices like food webs, they really play a big role for us to be able to indicate ecosystem recovery as compared to the traditional diversity low and high. So following this control, the clear water state um, following control is quite important, but at the same time, there's high chances that um, secondary invasion can come in place. So we need to be careful after controlling these systems that we do something um, for us to retain the biodiversity and we recommend active restoration following the management. And where we go in now as the Center for Biological Control, we know now we can be able to control these systems, control these avian plants. But what happens after control? Uh, we want to test um, some of these um, priority effects in the mesocosm setting and also the native species diversity to really play around to see how can we sustain the recovered um, ecosystem and its function following control. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions after all of this. Thank you. Um, and also would like to say thank you to all of these that make this study um, possible. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to talk today about an update to the catalog of target weeds and their biological control agents in South Africa, as well as a new way to assess the outcome of my control at a weed population level. All right, looking at the catalog first, um, it's been updated for the 2021 weed biocontrol review volume, which is due out soon. Uh, this will be the third published iteration of the catalog after the one in 1999 and 2011. Um, looking at the one in 2011, this is Klein's uh, catalog. Um, she um, indicated the target weed, region of origin, and degree of control. Um, a list of natural enemies considered for each weed species, the research status of uh, each natural enemy, in other words, uh, whether it had been released, established, under investigation, etc., and then the damage inflicted by each individual uh, biocontrol agent that was established in the field. And it should be noted that um, this damage inflicted differs from the overall degree of control of the of the weed okay looking at the current version it's similar to climb but uh, we've decided to divide it into four tables uh, following the global weed biocontrol catalog of winston um, the first three tables deal with exotic organisms in south africa um, the first one is those that have been intentionally introduced uh, we refer to this as classical weed biocontrol because um, the biocontrol agents form permanent populations on the weeds. Uh, and then those considered but not released. And then those discovered on the target weed in South Africa without being deliber deliberately released. Uh, the fourth table deals with bioherbicides, which are mainly locally sourced fungi. Uh, and this, uh, these are used for inundative biocontrol. In other words, basically used as a herbicide and the biocontrol uh, dissipates after a while. I'm going to be only considering the first um, two tables. So let's have a look at some results 
from this update. Um, in terms of weeds targeted, there have been 90 species and 27 families targeted since 1913. Um, 20 species have been added since 2011. And bi biological control agents have been released on 71 species and established on 66, 66 of these. Um, the provenance of most of the weeds is, is the Americas. And then uh, in terms of the uh, numbers of species per family, the Cactosi comes first, um, followed by the Fabaceae and Asteraceae. Looking at the exotic natural enemies considered, um, in total, 310 have been investigated since 1913. The blue bar represents um, insects, the orange bar, fungi, and uh, there were three mite species and one um, nematode. Now, um, 136 of these have been approved as biological control agents, while 174 have not been released. Of this uh, 136, 92 have established. In other words, the majority in the field have established. Um, and then in terms of those not released, uh, 78 of them were rejected by the researchers, um, mainly due to safety concerns, um, the post range was too wide, etc. And then 70 have been shelved and 24 un are under active investigation. Um, Looking at the established agents, uh, most of them, the majority uh, cause extensive damage in the field, while um, the other three categories of damage uh, are fairly evenly spread. And since Klein's catalog was published, 48 new exotic natural enemies have been investigated. Uh, 22 new biocontrol agents approved. Um, let's move on to looking at the effectiveness of biocontrol at uh, the level of the, the whole weed. Um, we previously used terms derived by Hoffman based on the need for other forms of control. So complete biocontrol, if a weed was under complete biocontrol, um, then there was no need for any other forms of control. Whereas if it was under substantial control, biocontrol, um, then there was need for other forms of control, mechanical, chemical, et cetera, um, but at reduced rates from what, what would be needed um, without biocontrol. And then negligible uh, was basically um, no, redu no reduction in, in other forms of control. Um, these Terms served as well for over 20 years and they were adopted uh, internationally. But eventually we felt the need for a more nuanced uh, system. And in 2019, Hoffman et al. Uh, proposed that we look at the outcomes of weed bar control at a plant population level. So this is um, the rust fungus on uh, Acacia saligna, and we want to know. Uh, not what it's doing to individual plants, but what it's doing to the whole plant population. Um, the figure on the right is uh, from Hoffman's paper, and uh, the solid black line is the uh, increase um, in invasion extent of a plant, of a weed over time. Um, below the tolerable threshold indicated here, the population of the weed is, is acceptable, acceptably low. So if we in, introduce a biocontrol agent at this stage of the weeds invasion, uh, there are several possible outcomes in terms of the plant uh, population. It may decrease as a result of biocontrol. Um, into category B, or if the biocontrol is particularly effective, it may even decrease below the tolerable 
threshold into category A. Um, if the biocontrol is not that effective, um, it, it will uh, still decrease the rate of increase of the invasion, but uh, not reverse it. So the plant population will, plant uh, invasion will increase, but at a slower rate than it would without biocontrol. And that uh, takes us into category C. And Moran, Moran et al. Um, implemented this for 54 weed species the next year. And these 54 species were selected based on uh, biocontrol agents being established for at least 10 years and therefore um, having reached their full capacity. Um, this is uh, the main table from the Moran et al. paper. Uh, Weed biocontrol often varies according to habitat. And so this has been included as a variable. And then four plant population parameters were selected um, for scoring according to the uh, three categories uh, in the previous slide. So plant density, plant biomass, the area invaded, and the rate of spread of the plant, which is a proxy for um, seed production usually um, with a four. And then we also included the previously used descriptors to compare. Okay, so if we look at a few examples, um, water lettuce is under very good biocontrol. Um, it's been reduced below the tol tolerable threshold. So all four parameters are A. Um, and to compare with the previous uh, system, um, basically there's agreement because it was under complete biocontrol. Then looking at Angerotina adenophora, um, biocontrol differs between riparian zones and drylands. Um, riparian zones are under poorer biocontrol and drylands apart from uh, the rate of spread. We'll see here that the previous um, descriptor was negligible biocontrol. And uh, we can, this shows that the, the new system is more nuanced. Okay, and then having a look finally at two acacia species on which there are agents that only attack the reproductive parts of the plant. Firstly, acacia cyclops. Um, it's got a gall midge that attacks the flower buds. And the rate of spread is rated as A, uh, which is good. And this is because there's no seed production or very little seed production anymore. You'll also see that the density is rated as A. And uh, this is because the biocontrol agent's been um, established for quite a while and therefore the soil seed banks are, are reduced, um, but the biomass and area are still rated as C. And then uh, Acacia mernsii is similar. It's got a gall midge in the flowers and the rate of spread again is rated as an A. But in this case, the density is rated as a C. Um, and this is because the, uh, uh, the biocontrol agent hasn't been established for that long and the soil seed banks are still very high. And furthermore, there's a difference between the winter rainfall and summer rainfall region in terms of the performance of the gall midge. I'd like to uh, thank uh, our funders, as well as uh, researchers who've contributed data for the updated uh, catalog, and also those who, who've advised me. Thank you. Brilliant, another session done and dusted. Thanks so much, Costas, and to the rest of the speakers for those really interesting talks. Uh, biocontrol is clearly in good hands in South Africa, uh, judging by the quality of the talks today. Um, before we go into 10 or 15 minutes of questions, just a quick reminder is that the Kim Weaver has put a link in the chat uh, to a quick survey uh, the conference organizers would love your opinions on the conference uh, and planning future events. So please take a few minutes of your time 
and go check the survey out. With that, let's go into some questions. Um, the first question is for Matt Paper. Um, Matt, is there any scope to replicate the types of studies you've done with other chewers or sap suckers, uh, for example, on water hyacinth, uh, neocatina versus accreditasis, or potentially even transferring this to another system, such as Falconia versus the beetles on Lantana? Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. So there has been a previous study by Basso et al. who've done research on the big uh, four of the other big five uh, weeds and with chewers, their agents on them, showing the effect of the chewers' response to elevated CO2. That's uh, Basso et al., uh, really quite a nice paper. Um, the CO2 facility is a international um, facility that provides these kind of services. There is a long waiting list, but there is very easy, is very doable um, experimentation and movement towards other systems. I mean, they're doing maze experiments currently, looking at elevated CO2 on maize, as well as savanna systems and encroachment. So okay. it is a very transferable um, way of doing things. Uh, Perfect. That everything. Yeah, that's great. Matt, please could I ask you to put the link to the Basso paper in the chat when you yeah. get a chance. If anyone's interested, they can go take a read of that. Um, the next question is for Rosalie. Um, Rosalie, it, the, the biocontrol program against uh, Egeria is obviously one of the first, if not the first, submerged weeds targeted. Uh, can you just confirm if it was the first? And after that, uh, it may be too soon, but have you seen an increase in interest in submerged weed biocontrol off of the back that, or off the back of the work that you've done in South Africa? Um, hi everyone. I'm sorry. The biocontrol program against Egeria Densa is the first submerged aquatic weed bio biocontrol program for South Africa. Um, and so Hydrelia Egeria is the first agent released, but it's not the first agent that was investigated. Um, there was a lot of work going into Hydrilla, um, but because they um, found a generalist moth um, controlling Hydrilla, they um, decided to shelf um, the biocontrol agents that they were investigating. Um, and then the second question, can you just quickly repeat that, please? Sure. The second part was uh, obviously that this is one of the first examples of uh, against targeting a submerged aquatic weed. Have you seen any interest from the international community um, with targeting other submerged aquatics uh, that they maybe haven't considered beforehand? Yes. So we actually earlier in this year had um, researchers from Australia asking us um, to send um, Hydrelia geria their way. Um, and I know um, New Zealand is also looking into Lagrosiphon major, which um, Nompumalele, one of our PhD students, is collaborating. But um, so we actually um, um, drove the research that was done on Hydrilla in, um, in America. Um, so I think the Hydrilla project actually set the game for submerged aquatic biological control. Yeah, that's really interesting. P pioneering work. Well done. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rosie. Um, the next question, Pride, it's coming your way. Uh, Pride, can you tell us, uh, are, are there any figures or data from post-fire scenarios uh, with Acacia and its biocontrol agents? Uh, if so, can you give an opinion on combining fire and biocontrol to manage invasive Australian Acacias? Hi everyone, how are you? Pride here from Stellenbosch, Fredenberg Campus, the ARC. Thank you for that brilliant question. I had actually answered that. Um, I think it was Philip Ivy who asked that uh, on the chat on the chat uh, window. Okay, yes, uh, very good question indeed. So we've got separate studies that we have done where we have looked at infestations that have been uh, raised down by fire. So we know that there's a site in Grahamstown that's the Hoisons uh, port. Um, as well as uh, the Banuk Valley in Stellenbosch. So what we are noticing there is where there's been a couple of fires, um, we, we, we then went in the system to do seed coring to see if there's any seed that actually survived the fire, 
And uh, because of the amount of biomass that these infestations carry, you notice that the fires are very intense. And what they do is they scorch all the surface seed or the seed that's just below the surface of the soil. And uh, the very few seed that survives is the one that then uh, germinates. And um, when we go into the system after germination to uh, look for seed, we notice that there is zero seed in there, meaning to say that either the seed has been destroyed by the fire or the few that uh, survived is the one that germinates. So I can already confirm to you that in Bano, for example, we've got two sites. We're fortunate enough to have had a fire on the mountain, um, on the mountain habitat, as well as a fire down on the uh, river basin. So it so happened that the fire was very, very hot on the river basin. And uh, we caught there zero seed. And we put transects. And on those transects, there were very few seeds that germinated. But then they've been overgrown by uh, secondary invaders. Well, I wouldn't want to call it secondary invaders as such. But then, you know, there are fans that take over when there's a fire. And uh, yeah. there's virtually nothing growing there. Okay. So on other sites in the mountain, because uh, after germination has happened, the seedlings are very much easier to manage. So we just give a recommendation to the landowners to say, uh, the saplings that have emerged, we've cored into the ground, there isn't any seed. So all the seed is the one that is germinated. And what the they do is they just mow that down uh, or then they spray herbicide. So theoretically speaking, we shouldn't see any more um, uh, inv invasive species coming out of the species that is under biocontrol. And we can testify that in Grahamstown, the Howison spot, I think I wrote a um, popular article in PPRI News about two years ago, where we saw in Grahamstown, uh, just as you are entering into Grahamstown on the left, it used to be infested with Acacia longifolia, for instance. And um, because Thanks, of Brian. the series of fires that has happened there, you don't see anything there. It's now only grass growing there, and you have got cattle moving in there. So, yeah. Um, okay. Th thanks very much. As far as I can comment, as far as yeah. fire is concerned, yes. Right, we've got a, a few a few questions for you in the chat. We'll we'll try and loop back to you, but if not, you're going to be a very very busy man in the chats uh, answering okay. questions. So, thank you so much for that answer and a really really cool yes. talk. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Cool. Uh, the next question uh, is for Noeji. Um, do we know which insects are responsible for the observed reductions in lantana performance? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the question. So I don't know whether I didn't emphasize properly in my, in my talk. Um, so we looked at the combined impact of all uh, biocontrol mm -hmm. agents in the area. So you're not per se, uh, looking at uh, singling out one or two insects so it was a combined yeah. uh, the whole choir yeah okay yeah. and do, do you uh do you by any chance have any plans to try and isolate which of the the agents are more damaging well we've we've done that already so um for example some studies that we conducted in the uh, i mean by uh, my colleague um Rudura in the KwaZulu, KwaZulu natal area um he looked at uh, a cereal only, which is a, a flower growing uh, uh, mite. And it is it's actually doing uh, very, very well with scoring of 93% reduction in, uh, in seed production. Yeah. So we wanted to look at the uh, effect of these agents in, in more inland uh, environments so in Mpumalanga. Okay, brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you for a really interesting talk. It's great, great to see. Okay. Uh, progress being made towards controlling Lantana. Uh, next up, Zeze, uh, there's a question for you. Um, Zeze, it looks like a few people were concerned about non-target effects uh, of the cochineal insects. Uh, will there be any con community engagement or any other measures uh, implemented to try and address these concerns? Hello. Can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Yeah, there were two participants which had concerns about non-target effects of well control. The other one was not sure if well control is safe, and the other one and the other one does not does not think it's safe. So these have highlighted that the CPC has to outreach to people through 
through engaging with them via community engagement to educate them as well as to make biological control known outside there. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's good. Great to know it's already been addressed and congrats. It's a really interesting study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Costas, um, there is a long question for you. I'm just going to quickly find it in the chat again. Uh, Costas, it's great to see the 2011 scheme, but is the plan to still include the 1995 scoring in the reports? The advantage of Hoffman 1995 scheme is that it's an outcome based on the actual result in terms of management. It, also, it is also very easy to understand. The 2011 scheme provides much more nuance, but it's largely about outputs, i.e. effects on plant population, not the outcome in terms of what needs to be done or impacts. Um, can you hear me? I don't, I, my video doesn't seem to be working. That's fine. I, I can hear you clearly, Costas. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry for the video. Um, yes, uh, it's a good point, John. Um, it is. I, I originally had a, a final slide saying um, it's sort of um, not not really satisfying to to have um, you know not what not one word to to describe the the weed the the, the level of control of the weed um, and uh, it's probably something that we we do need to discuss at future weed biocontrol. Uh, research meetings, you know, to see whether we we should still have maybe both systems, and um, they provide different or different tar target audiences. So the one is ecological, what the weed is actually doing in the field in terms of um, its population, and then the other one would be a single kind of moniker, which uh, gives you an idea of where the control is at. So yeah, no, it's a good point. Uh, thanks, Costas. And one last quick question is, uh, you said that uh, the catalog will be available in the 2021 review series, but will it be made publicly available and updated in real time uh, between now and the next review series in 2031? And can people submit uh, recommendations for updates to the catalog? Um, yes, yeah. So historically, it's um, been updated every year. Um, the last up actual update was in 2018, and that's um, on the uh, ARC website. So usually, we, we send out a, you know an email and to all the researchers, and uh, it, it will probably be updated next year or the or the year after. Okay. Cool. Th thanks very much. That's that's very clear. Okay, I think we, we run out of time to answer more live questions. Uh, just a reminder to the speakers, please do try and answer the, the remaining questions in the Q&A session. Um, that draws the scientific program to an end. Thank you so much to everyone for attending. Congratulations for making it this far. Um, try to wean yourself off the caffeine now that the conference is over. Um, I just want to quickly say thank you again to all of the speakers uh, and thank you to everyone for attending um, and a, a real special thank you again to Professor Harriet Hins, our keynote speaker. Uh, it was a, a privilege to have her on and we, we learned a lot. So thank you again, Harriet. Um, and I'll now hand over to the conference organizers for some final remarks. Thank you, everyone, and keep safe. Hi everyone, um, next up we'll have um, Martin Hill representing the IOBC ATRS regional office um, giving the symposium summary. Um, over to you, Martin. 
Thanks very much, uh, Kim, and uh, for affording me the opportunity to um, to to just synthesise really what we've what we've uh, learned over the last uh, two and a half days. Um, the title of the of the symposium was um, Africa Acting Together Against Biological Invasions, and I think we've um, by and large um, addressed a lot of that. Although, um, as you'll see from my um, during the, the course of this presentation, I think there's more work possibly that we could do. We could do there. I really enjoyed the the um, structure of the program. I think following uh, Blackburn et al.'s uh, unified framework gave the gave the symposium structure. Um, I like the fact that we we started at the beginning. We worked all the way through um, um, to management, um, and I think that um, that for, for somebody like me, um, I, I need that logic. <clears throat> so I'm going to just go through each day and pick out some of the salient points. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to present right at the end of this um, a, a number of challenges uh, that I see going forward in terms of the science of invasion biology here um, in South Africa and, and further afield. So we opened day one um, by with, with an address by the, the Minister of, um, of uh, uh, Forestry, Fisheries, and environment, Minister Creasy. And what I really enjoyed about that was that she told us, and I, and I, and I really do believe that the government takes uh, biodiversity seriously and the government takes the role that invasion has on impacting biodiversity very seriously. And she, ur she, she really um, urged us to apply our minds to understanding how invasive species get into the country, what they do when they're here and how we can mitigate their impacts. And, and I think by and large, we've done that over the last uh, two and a half days. Um, Eki uh, Brockerhoff uh, presented, um, started off the scientific program, presented at plenary, um, and he introduced this term, which I hadn't heard before, um, of bridgehead effects. And this is how invasive species uh, move and how invasive species um, get into one country and then move on to another country. And I guess at the end of the day, he was, he was warning us against um, Trojan horses. We then learned um, about the role of the global village um, and uh, in how invasive species move, um, certainly in the forestry industry, um, and some of the large impacts that invasive species are having um, in, in the forestry industry um, in South Africa. Caitlin Faulkner then um, told us that South Africa was the, the main route in which invasive species get into the African continent, uh, that, that uh, many species, she showed that many species come into South Africa first, um, and then move um, in, into the rest of the continent. Um, but that there are other species and, and one that we're working on at the moment, uh, Diferina citri, um, the, um, the, the, the citrus psyllid, and the vector of um, Asian greening, uh, which has done the reverse. It got into Tanzania um, where we're plotting its moving uh, movement south. So yes, um, many species do come into South Africa, but other species come in from, from other areas as well. I really enjoyed Marcus Burns' talk on, on the Mooty trade. Um, and Marcus, uh, once again, from, from dung beetles to Mooty through tamarics, water hyacinth, and, and cactus, well done. Um, in the establishment and spread session, uh, Colleen Downs presented a plenary on how, um, how our indigenous uh, bird and mammal species have been largely duped into uh, becoming spreaders of invasive, some of our main invasive species um, in the South Africa. And um, at the end of her talk, I was sort of applying my mind to what we can do about that. Um, and I could just imagine the ethics application uh, for um, introducing some form of um, mechanical, chemical, or biological control um, of some of those vectors. Um, we've probably got a way to go there. And then in that session, I, I really... I really enjoyed Sage Wansel's talk. Um, and this was because we spent a lot of time over the last couple of days and a lot of time um, in the last decade um, putting species onto lists and motivating why species should be in particular categories um, on lists. And what Sage showed us with the example with pickerel weed is that although pickerel weed is here and although pickerel weed is invasive, it's not very, very invasive. The fact that we've only got short styled plants here and the fact that we've the plant doesn't produce seed is really preventing its invasion in, in, in a lot of ways. And so although the species is here, the take home message from her talk 
was that we mustn't ever introduce any other, um, uh, I guess, morphs, um, genotypes of pickerel weed, of the genus uh, Pontederia cordata, and that maybe we need to, to look at um, it may, the, 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 the taxonomic entity that we, that we use. The same would go for something like Murrophilum aquaticum, um, which is invasive here. Uh, we could, we've got very good control of it, uh, but we've only got female plants. And so we need to really guard against introducing more of the same species um, in, 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 in a lot of ways. And the day finished off uh, with a workshop investigating a possible protocol for declaring um, alien species absent from South Africa. Um, this workshop, predictably, as workshops do, uh, brought up more, more questions and answers. And during that workshop, I wondered whether we shouldn't also apply our minds a little bit to not species which are maybe not absent. Um, we need to maybe apply our minds to species, how we, do, how we categorize species which are maybe no longer invasive in South Africa. Um, so they, they are, they, they are in, um, introduced, um, and through whatever means, um, they're no longer invasive. And, and something like a Puntia fica syndica uh, would be an example of that. Is there a way that we can, um, we can recategorize it uh, no longer as an invasive species um, per se? Um, day two started um, with a session on the impact of invasive alien species. Uh, Sabrina introduced us to some new terminology adopted by the IUCN to, to categorize um, uh, impacts. Um, John Wilson asked us to, to get involved, roll up our shirt sleeves um, and get involved in uh, developing risk assessments uh, for invasive alien species. There were a couple of excellent papers uh, from the guys at FABI on polyphagous shot hole borer um, and how we, go, how we really need to go forward in looking at methods for, for controlling uh, polyphagous shot hole borer. Um, and then Antonella Petrozella finished off the session, um, and what she showed us, which is something that, that I think is really important, um, she used uh, the case of water hyacinth on, on Harabias Bodan, and she showed us that if we don't address the drivers of invasion, if we take one invasive species out of a system, it's going to be replaced by another. Um, and she showed this very clearly with the algal bloom uh, which, which followed uh, the removal of a hectare of water hyacinth from that system. And I think that's something we really need to look at. What is really driving um, the, the, the invasion? Uh, we then got into the management session and we started off with a, with a dedication to Dr. Olaf Vale, uh, recognizing his work in mitigating um, freshwater um, invasion. And, um, and, and as Guy Preston has pointedly said, you know, Olaf will be, will be sadly missed. The first bit of the session uh, dealt with how we can use technology uh, to, to detect species, uh, but also to understand, understand landscape changes. Um, and the papers certainly by Jeetam and Dave Kinzer um, showed us that, but uh, there was a caveat to that. And that is that um, despite the fact that we can use this imagery, uh, ground truthing um, is still important, but it's a very, very valuable tool. Um, Coletzo um, and Grant Martin, um, outlined a new program targeting invasives in the montane grassland regions, which, as we know, are extremely threatened and vulnerable um, uh, regions. Llewellyn Foxcroft summarized the excellent efforts um, on behalf of Sand Parks um, in um, managing invasive species there. And then there were several papers on herbicide application. And what was really pleasing to see here was how um, it wasn't just herbicide application, it was, a, it was an approach towards um, integrated management. And I think we, we, haven't, we haven't cracked that nut. Um, I still think there's a lot of work that we have to do fully understanding how, um, how we can best um, uh, pull all the tools to the table in an, integrated, in an integrated approach. There was an impassioned plea from Andrew Turner to relook at the biocontrol of pines. And all I can say is it looks like, Andrew, you've got yourself a job. And then day two finished uh, with a workshop hosted by Sambi and Sungai outlined, outlined the progress um, that has been made in the understanding and management of invasives um, in South Africa um, since the first national report on biological invasion. Day three, um, today, uh, we, looked at, we looked at management of invasives, continued management of invasives. Um, and the main theme of today, obviously, was, was biological control. And today started with a very bittersweet moment. 
um, with a, a um, dedication to Dr. Stefan Nierse presented by the MA van der Westhuizen. Um, and, and as we all know, Stefan will be massively missed um, in this environment. And there's not a day that goes past that I don't use something um, that uh, Stefan taught me. Harriet Hines presented a, a very eloquent paper on the challenges facing biological control um, in the world. But it was heartening to see, um, in her opinion, um, that South Africa is doing well in this field. Um, but what I took from her, her talk was maybe the role that South Africa has to play um, in engaging uh, the rest of the continent. Um, and, and, and this is something that certainly Costas Zachariades, as um, president of the IOBC ATRS region, is looking into, is how do we um, share our, our experiences um, within Africa? How do we, in the, in the, um, to meet the, the, the mandate of this meeting, which is Africa really solving Africa's problems in terms of biological invasion? And I think this is something that um, we, we need to take up through the IOBC ATRS, ATRS region. And then there are a series of papers on the full chain of biological control from pre-release studies um, through to post-release studies, um, including swarms of water hyacinth agents irritating the fine folk of, of Hodobiosport Dam. The session finished uh, with Costa Zachariades presenting the database of weed biocontrol agents in South Africa. This is an amazing resource. Uh, once again, it's probably something that we could roll out to the rest of the continent. Um, and it's a live document, and I think that's its value that it gets up, updated. Now to the challenges. Um, all in all, I think that the, I believe the Congress presented some excellent research into the science of invasion. But it would be really remiss of me not to highlight what I see some of the, some of the gaps are or some of the cha challenges going, going forward. Over the last two and a half days, there was only one talk, and that presented earlier today by Matt Paper, on the role of, of climate change on invasion and its management. Um, and I think this is something we, we, we need to address. Once again, it was only on the, on the last day that we heard a talk on the role of restoration um, and in, in, the, in the control of invasive alien, alien um, species. And I think this is something that we really need to address. But the main gap that I see is that we're very, very good at working out how invasives get here. We're very good at working out why they establish or why they don't. We're very good at working out their impacts. We're good in some ways at, at mitigating those, those impacts through control. But I think we need, and this is a challenge, I guess, for the, for the organizers of the next, next um, symposium. Um, where are the guys who are doing the mass clearing and the restoration? Um, where are the implementers? And I think that we are maybe failing our man in our mandate by not presenting more research into how we have alleviated the impacts of invasive alien species um, through implementation of the control uh, of the control options, whether they be mechanical, chemical, or biological. So that is my my synthesis of the meeting. Um, I think the, 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 the meeting did well in meeting its mandate, uh, but I think there are some challenges um, going forward and I will leave it there. Thank you, Professor Martin Hill, um, for the great summary of the last two and a half days. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Sebralo, who will be talking about, from Sambi, about, uh, who will be talking about the next symposium. 2022. Over to you, Seb. Thank you very much, colleagues. Thank you very much, all the attendees and the panelists, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm Sebata Olagashlao, and I lead the work on biological invasions at Sanbi, South African National Biodiversity Institute. So my task is really to, uh, to, to to plan a way forward in terms of the next meeting. And I really would like to congratulate the Center for Bi Biological Control at Rose University and the partners for a wonderful symposium, virtual symposium. I think this has been fantastic and the baseline has been set and we promise that uh, next year we will keep the same standards, uh, if not better. So the symposium next year, 
is um, if everything is still, obviously everything is still provisional, but we are planning that it will be a physical meeting and we are planning it with the University of Fort Hare at Alice. And we are under, still undergoing discussions in terms of how that is going to uh, unfold. It will be held during mid-year uh, during the university break and we will confirm all the exact times when the university calendars are confirmed. The last time it was held in the Eastern Cape was probably in 2013 and it's about time that we go back there and reinvigorate and learn about all the activities that are done in the Eastern Cape. We have not decided yet on the theme, but we will welcome any themes. Uh, we have just had a challenge from Martin in terms of implementers and implementing activities and all of that. So we welcome any suggestions on the theme so that we can make this uh, 2022 symposium a good one as well. We haven't decided yet in terms of the chairpersonship and also the scientific committee and all of that, but we look forward to any people, any, any volunteers to help us with the scientific committee and all the other activities in terms of administration and all of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seb, for um, a bit of insight into next year's symposium. Next up, um, we just have our um, one of our chairs of our scientific committee, committee, Professor Bernard Slippers. He's going to be closing the event, um, and yeah, you'll hear from me later in an email. But this is bye from me, and over to you, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kim. It, it's a uh, it's a wonderful. Can you all hear me, Lily? Sound good. Yes, you sound good, and Great. we can hear you. Thank you. It's uh, it's a wonderful privilege for me to have been involved um, with the sense of, of uh, biological control in, in organizing this meeting and having spent three fantastic days with all of you online, likely like many of you, tired of Zoom, but also stimulated and excited about everything that we have seen and heard. It's my pleasure to, on behalf of the organizing committee, announce the winners of the best oral and poster, uh, best oral presentation by a student and best poster presentation by a student. So right ahead with it. So in the first place, uh, in this last session, Matthew Paper, the chewers of sap feeders, who takes the biggest bite out of the water hyacinth under elevated CO2. An important topic as Martin's also um, indicate, uh, just highlighted for us. So congratulations, Matthew. And in the second place, Sage Wanzel on invasion biology of Pondaderia caudata in South Africa. Congratulations to both of you. Then the best posters, Siasonga and Siva, Megamelis and Fungi for, what, um, for water hyacinth, on water hyacinth. Congre congratulations, Sia and Nobule Mogubane, in the second place, an assessment of Tithonia tabiformis invasion along Eswatini South African border. Congratulations to both of you, oh, both of you and all four of you, a courtesy of the Center of Biological Control, will receive a copy of the book, Biological Invasions in South Africa by Brian Wilhelm and co-authors. But I would also with Martin like to thank all the presenters and participants the keynotes, the 60 talks, the 23 posters, the workshops, the memorials for the effort that's gone into preparing uh, the, the quality of the material that you presented to us. When we originally planned this for last year, it would have been held um, here on the University of Pretoria campus at Future Africa. And it was obvious last year, of course, that we couldn't do it, but I, I think I for one hope that we could partly do it in uh, in, in person this year, but it was not possible. But there are no, reg no regrets, I think, um, if we look back on an incredible and a unique meeting that we've had, and one that no doubt we will never forget, I think. I think, like me, you'll all be longing to get out of your offices and homes and to be interacting with each other. But I'm also so thankful for uh, looking back at the meeting for what we've learned and everything we've gained. So we, we've also gained things that we would have otherwise not have had. One of which is the number of people we've been able to engage. Um, Kim let me know that there were 404 people registered for this meeting. 
and we still have, I don't know how many people are still online, but well over 100 people, 130 people are um, still signed in at this, at this point. And of course, there are the recordings that will now be available afterwards. So we can go back, learn more, make the connections. It's, I, I'd say this has perhaps also been one of the most interactive meeting, online meetings that I've been in. Um, and there were, despite the fact that we are not together, uh, certainly for me, a number of interactions that will come from this um, and more that I'm sure we will hear about at the, at the next meeting. And the success of this um, has in no small part been due to the exceptional and seemingly effort, seemingly effortless management of this meeting. But it's of course not been effortless by any stretch of the imagination. So I'd like to ask that you allow me to express deep appreciation on behalf of all of us to a really special team of people. And, and just a small diversion on the way to work this morning, um, I was listening to a talk about how our uh, world of work will be changing. And what they were talking about is not just whether we'd be working from home or not, but really the how we would value working in teams, the kinds of people we've relied on to carry us through this very difficult period. And I think there's a team like that that has made this special occasion possible. So allow me to, think, to thank them. So the organizing committee led by Philip Ivey, Kim, Kim Weaver, Kim Canavan, Esther Mostert and, and Brett Hurley. It's hard to express how impressed and thankful I am for the detail, the effort, uh, continuing to lift the weight when it must have been incredibly hard um, uh, to, to do so. Thank you for what you've produced. It was truly exceptional. To the rest of the scientific committee, Martin Hill and, and Costa Zacharides, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with, with both of you. And Manda and Caitlin and Shirk and Lorraine and Yolanda and Pomozzo and Zukudu and Lungeli and Ryan and Samuel and Guy who have uh, been involved in putting the scientific program together and guiding us through us. Thank you so much um, for that. Um, I, I'm deeply impressed also by the technical support and we'll recognize that from the National Arts Festival that have made this uh, so seamless and, and at, uh, at such an affordable cost uh, that we could make this uh, meeting uh, available for free to everybody. And then our sponsors, Oskverna, uh, also thank you to them for sticking with us. And finally, I, would, I want to highlight and I'm sharing my screen, I hope you can see the, um, the logo presented there, uh, really a beautiful logo that was produced by Albino Designs for this meeting, representing the diversity of the organisms, I think that we've, uh, the systems that we've, that we've heard about in the past few days, but also uh, reflecting the central mandate of this meeting, reflecting on the connectivity um, of our systems across the African continent. I'm sure everybody on this stand on this call understands why it is so essential for the success of what we do in terms of biological invasions that we take note of and connect um, with our colleagues from across the continent. I think that's perhaps also one of the gaps that I would point out, including in my own talk, data gaps from the rest of the continent uh, related to the systems that we work on. But it's also an opportunity that we now have, and I think a call to action that I will add along with, uh, along with Martin, that we in future, uh, um, we will no doubt be meeting in person, but we'll likely also have online opportunities to connect with colleagues from around the world and across the continent. And can we not all take up um, this call and make sure that at the next meeting, we connect at least one colleague from another African country to this meeting. It really should be so easy and thereby strengthen the science and strengthen the implementation of the control of biological invasions. And who knows, maybe in future, this might not only be a national symposium on biological invasions, but an African symposium on biological invasions. Kim is going to share this, um, this logo with you, a high quality version of that. And we hope that you'd be printing it on a on a t-shirt or on a water bottle or something like that and be reminded of this meeting but also be reminded of that um, really important call to action for all of us 
with that, I'm going to close off and um, thank you all again for your participation. Thank everybody who's worked so hard to make this very special meeting possible and wish you all the very best and look forward to seeing you in the field, in the lab or at the next meeting. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much.